For thousands of years, the Space Wolves have loyally served the Emperor of Mankind. They are a noble chapter of Space Marines, their coordinated savagery unequaled. Their warrior packs are hunters and slayers of heretics, mutants, xenos, and demons. There is no leashing them. The tendrils of the Ice Kraken cannot bind them. They are the wind that howls through the trembling forest. They are the ship that splits the storm. Theirs is the joy of warriors born. Theirs is the barking laughter in the face of monstrous evil, the spittle in its eye. Theirs is the grin that widens and the fangs that gleam. Theirs are the growls on the edge of hearing, the fur draped shapes in the blizzard. It is their roars that dog-frenzied fight, their runic blades that cleave and their claws that rend. Do you sense the hairs on your back standing and the chill of ice spearing your heart? Do you see pitiless yellow eyes calculating your every weakness? You're being hunted. Are you afraid? You should be. For they are the Emperor's executioners. Prologue, a tale of woe, a tale of betrayal. The Eternal Champions A chapter of the Adeptus Astartes that have fallen from grace. Not to chaos, but to the exact same issues that perhaps Lutheron, the tyrant of Badab, might find all too familiar. The pressures of an eternal war maybe, or a failure in their character. Who is to tell? The opening of the Great Rift brought turmoil and terror, but it has been a long time since then. Many Primaris chapters and existing ones have been allotted areas turf to defend, but as with everything in the Imperium, they were found to be rigid, inflexible. Arguments betwixt human armies fighting the same foes devolved into tensions on borders, as pride gave rise to discourses of jurisdiction. Lamentably, this would often mean that the culprits, the invaders, were permitted to disappear again. Trapped within a stretch of the galaxy, not able to move from it, the Eternal Champions felt that some of their compatriots in the other regions had led them down time and again. Not that they had been entirely fair. The other chapters had their own issues, their own disasters and wars that had often prevented them from doing what the Eternal Champions construed as best. The local human forces had proven more loyal to the Eternal Champions than their normal governors, lords and generals. This was initially due to an all-pervasive family of rogue traders and the local nobility with a stranglehold on power. Near all of the important positions in the entire region were held by one subset of the mighty clan, Trigus Baltorn. When the Eternal Champions first took over the direct ordering of one system after another in their zone, at first sidelining or overriding the authority of these nobles, they found the common soldiery and naval forces to be exceptional. Lions led by donkeys. But this trend of commandeering office and direct martial control crept and crept, 
until only 50 years ago, the Eternal Champions took what they thought was the next natural step. An assassination attempt against the Eternal Champions chapter master, Krillon Varson, sparked it all off. Upon the initiation of yet another purge of the outlying systems, one young noble too many had been unceremoniously informed that he was superfluous to a requirement and sent packing. The young noble burned all of his resources, supported by many young buck in the nobility that had been on the receiving end of the same treatment, and they secured what they thought an overwhelming response. The band of ruffians that were paid to put an end to the life of Chapter Master Varson were mutants, psychers, and low-life scum of the worst order. They were nearly unstoppable in their hives, so much so that they now had control of the activities of nearly half a planet. Equipped with rare and outlawed archaeotech, they felt that they were more than up to the task. When a state banquet was held in honor of the Eternal Champions, it all happened so quickly. The thugs attacked the ceremonial chariot of the Chapter Master and shot into it and his surrounding honor guard with everything they had. Warp-born attacks lashed the honor guard. Melter and plasma shot smashed into the Chapter Master and utterly destroyed his chariot. Yet, his personal protection field, his iron halo, kept him alive. That and his swift reactions. The Eternal Champions were forced to retreat pace by pace, forever attacked by hordes of gangers who poured from every grill and entry from the sewer system. All the while their leaders threw every flavor of hell at the marines. But it was not the attack of the mutants and the traitorous gangs that was of most note. For when the dust settled, only five marines had been slain, the rest now outside of the city preparing to be taken off-world. Yet the chapter master noted this one issue with great interest. None of the civil forces, PDF or city guard, had moved a muscle. In fact, none had been present whatsoever. None could have denuded the causeway of the parade without phenomenal connections at the very top. And so, the Eternal Champions considered this an act of war. And they knew exactly who was behind it. As far as they were concerned, the entire Trigus Baltorn family their clan across the entire sector. And they would live just long enough to regret their young buck's actions. Over the next three years, the Eternal Champions threw out their net, practically ignoring anything other than the very worst Xenos predations as they systematically went through the region and struck every known planet that was under the thumb of the Trigus Baltorns and wiped them out. Because they were Astartes, the hits were so targeted, so careful, so swift and effective that there was practically no civil unrest. For the Trigus Baltons had ruled with an iron glove, had been tyrants of the worst order, their group think never being challenged through the entire region. They had slid to worse and worse divorce from their populace and, as many did in the Imperium, they used their serfs like base chattels. So when the Eternal Champion swept through, Elevating men and women who would be loyal to them, but also adept at holding the fort, the results were almost immediate. The corruption, simony, nepotism and waste was burned away like a brush fire, and prosperity immediately started to trickle down across the Marines' holdings. If this were all, then perhaps the High Council of Terror may have been too busy to take note. After all, what was the eradication of one regional noble family, weighed against the wars versus the Xenos threat, the constant siege performed by the forces of chaos, the slow consumption of the galaxy by the great devouring Tyranid? Huh. Barely noticeable. Alas, if the Eternal Champions had just left it there, been content with command of the systems that they defended, then perhaps they would have been lauded even today. But that did not happen. Power corrupts, as they rightly say, and the road to damnation is always paved with good intentions. Thus did the situation slide the only way it could, downward. For the Eternal Champions placed themselves above all, 
They now considered their little zone to be the template by which the entire front nearest the tear across the galaxy should be organized. When their perceived failings of other chaplains occurred, they simply moved in. The Hrad migration across some of their neighboring chapters' most populous worlds did nothing to change the champion's opinion that the simultaneous assault of War Kilmore should have been stopped in its tracks. The Hrad migration had been fought with everything the legates of Terra and, and Ironheart's chapters could muster, but it was clearly not enough for the Eternal Champions. Hence did the Eternal Champions annex half of the worlds of the Maud chapters, executing the existing lords and nobility of these worlds, replacing them with their own trusted men and families. The legates of Terra were no cowards, but would not raise arms against another chapter without legal right on their side. So an embassy was sent to the High Council on Terra for intervention. The Ironheart's chapter did not react with such legalities in mind. They had been attacked, and they intended to sweep the Eternal Champions and their puppets from their fiefdom. But the efficiency of the Eternal Champions, the grip on the imagination of the populace, had reached further than the Ironheart or anyone could have predicted, and they were informed of it all. Only hours before the Ironheart's fleet was about to begin its campaign, they detected an incoming set of signals. A swarm of hundreds, nay thousands, of long-range missiles had been launched from freighters and other support vessels under the control of the Eternal Champions. From the dark of the void, they had crept just outside the Ironheart's augers and simply unleashed their entire payloads. The sheer volume of missiles could not be stopped and it tore the Ironheart's escort vessels to pieces. Two battle barges were crippled, and a third destroyed. When the Eternal Warrior's full fleet dipped out of the shadow of a nearby moon and powered towards the Ironheart's formation, they gave only one option. To avoid utter destruction, the Eternal Champions would accept nothing but unconditional surrender of every ship, every marine or naval officer working under the Ironheart's. The next hours were a travesty that would have made the Emperor himself weep if he were still able. For the Iron Hearts could not be bowed, would not be broken, but nor could they withstand this perfectly executed assault. And by the end of the day, not one Iron Heart ship had power, and not one Iron Heart Marine was left alive. The Legates of Terror were shocked to the core and as soon as they heard of the massacre, they made desperate calls to all other chapters in their area. Still reeling from their casualties at the hands of the Hrad, they could not do this alone. The Eternal Champions had turned on their own, had become kinslayers and traitors. Not only this, but they had also become grave robbers. No depth now seemed beyond the Eternal Champions, as they raided the chapter fortress of the Ironhearts, and took every last scrap of tech, tools, artifacts, and even the gene seed. They slaughtered the chapter serfs that remained there, valiantly attempting to guard the last vestiges of a now dead chapter. But the reputation of the Eternal Champions was a hard thing to fight against. So few responded, as they thought it another border scuffle between egos. None could really believe that the Champions would wipe out the Iron Hearts. Another chapter? No. But there was one chapter that did respond, for they had once fought side by side with the Iron Hearts themselves, and they had bonds of friendship, bonds of honor, bonds of blood with them. And for the Eternal Champions, it could not have been worse if they had walked into the palace on Terra and spat in the Lord Regent's face. Not worse if they had flown into the warp with Gellerfields down and a thousand psychers strapped to their hulls. For three words came back to the chapter master of the Legates of Terror. He dread, We are coming. When the Legates saw the name on the sender, the crest of his chapter, they knew vengeance would be theirs. For it had one ancient symbol on it, a symbol of an animal that did not exist on 99% of the Imperium or more. Yet it was recognized across every civilized planet of the Imperium and plenty that were not so civilized. It was a wolf. 
the Emperor's own executioners were on their way. The sons of Ras were coming. From the very first, the Eternal Champion's ego brought them low. For when a lone Space Wolf's battle barge appeared in their outermost system and hailed for their surrender, it was scoffed at. A pity. It was their only one chance. But Chapter Master Krillon Varson was not the bootlace of, of Lufthuron, had no real idea of what they had set in motion. Massacring civilians and the noble stuffed shirts was one thing. Springing a trap on the Iron Hearts was another. But not in the last hundred years or more had they fought against Marines properly. Not really. Let alone these Space Marines. The Sons of Russ. And nor did they take the threat seriously. For the Eternal Champions were Primaris Marines. And they thought the Space Wolves were not. The flotilla of cruisers and escorts that flew out to teach the wolves a lesson were soon in hot pursuit of the barge, only to be then ambushed themselves, as from every quarter escorts, cruisers and another battle barge surrounded them and fell on them like, well, wolves. Missiles, lances and all hell was unleashed within mere seconds of the ships of the wolves appearing on the Orspex augers and the Eternal Champions found themselves utterly outclassed. Only two ships managed to turn tail and flee, fighting their way through the encirclement with a horrific mauling to show for it. And thus the war began, its new tempo set. No longer would the Eternal Champions strut around their own worlds, thinking them impregnable as one after another fell in quick succession, but never in any order or logical place with what seemed like no structure at all. They found it was impossible to outthink or outmaneuver the wolves, as it was simply impossible to predict. At one point, the Eternal Champions fell to calculating the most unlikely and most audacious targets that would be almost insane to attack. It worked for two engagements only, for even then, even when outnumbered and supposedly trapped, the wolves would snatch the systems from the champions and cause blistering casualty reports. Their berserker rages on the field were unstoppable, but their sheer rage and bravery was only outshone by one thing, the strategic ability. And very soon, the populace of the Eternal Champions Protectorate were cheering for the attackers. For the wolves never targeted civilians, never burned down entire cities just to get up one or two men as others would, and when they captured worlds, there were few reprisals. The leaders, those who had made common cause with the Eternal Champions, were removed from their seats of power, but also their lives. But this is where the buck usually stopped. When support columns of planetary defense forces or Imperial Guard who had bent the knee to Chapter Master Krillon Varson surrendered, they were instantly given clemency. Despite their ferocity towards the traitor marines and any forces who stood with them, the honor displayed by the Space Wolves was a thing of awe. And within months, the Eternal Champions were no longer able to resupply at any of the worlds that were so ardently supportive only a year before. The Champions were now being hunted down and wiped out. So... Chapter Master Krillon Varson, with little choice, gathered his remaining marines on their cold home world, Morana, and prepared for his surrender. When the fleet of the Legates of Terror and the Space Wolves finally appeared and ploughed towards the Ice World, Krillon Varson ignored the hails from the Legates, utterly, and sent one communication to the lead ship of the Volca Fenrica, with a simple statement. We are both sons of ice and snow. You are the greater hunters, the greater wolves. We bear our necks to you and only you. We offer unconditional surrender to the sons of Russ alone. The response from the lead ship was simple and left the hearers ashen-faced. You request to surrender? You have betrayed your brothers. You have slain your brothers. You have picked over the carcasses of your brothers. You have butchered their last little people, their defenseless serfs. You have taken their banners, their weapons, 
their honor, and their future. And now you speak to us of brotherhood? To those who hold blood pact and shared honor with the chapter you have eradicated from the Allfather's armies? We say you are the honorless and besmirch the gene seed in your very bodies. You are no brothers to the sons of the Rus. Die on your feet or die on your knees. We care not. Request denied. The eternal champions thus mustered the majority of their remaining chapter strength and stood on the walls of their fortress monastery. It proved to be a red day, with the mist was heavy in the eyes of the space walls, where the legates themselves gave no quarter, despite their seed being not of the Ras. The very ferocity of the wolves seemed infectious, righteous. And in less than a day, the eternal champions were exterminated. Their monastery, the site of vicious tunnel and corridor fighting, Alas, this just paid into the hands of the wolves, and they did what they do best. They hunted down every last marine in that ancient Bastille and put them to the sword. The oath of vengeance was fulfilled to the satisfaction of the legates of terror, but the wolves were not so blasé about the endeavor, for they had shot down one of a group of eternal champion storm ravens heading north, away from the carnage. And when the survivors of the crash were put to the question, a new horror was revealed. The eternal warriors had sent their gene seed north in a last bid to escape the wrath of the wolves. But worse, the champions had fallen so far. For they had made pacts with a group of brigands and were preparing to take their seed, their future off-world, to be a threat for the future. Not only this, the vile scum were revealed to have offered the brigands payment in gene seed, just not their own. They would pay in the gene seed of the Iron Hearts, which they had taken from the fortress monastery of that honorable chapter when they extinguished their light. And thus it was that the last apothecary and captain of the Eternal Champions were holed up somewhere in the northern polar cap, hiding and waiting for their deliverance. The legates of Terra were the more numerous, as only one great company of the wolves were present, and so it was agreed by both the Wolf Lord and the chapter master of the legates that they would create combined formations and send them out to find this northern Bastille, this last hiding place of the traitors. And they had but two goals only. The rescue of the gene seed of the Iron Hearts, and the annihilation of the last of the Eternal Champions. The wind lashed around the old outpost, a small fortification left to rack and ruin. Nobody remembered who had made it or why. It had always been there. Certainly from before the Eternal Champions had first come to Morana. It was a threadbare thing, a stopping off point only. Garrisoned by a company of planetary defense force who turned their coats at the first sign of shooting, there was an almost universal revulsion exhibited towards its men by all who arrived and swiftly departed after refueling. It was being used as a forward camp for the forces of the Legates of Terra and the Space Wars, who were meant to meet before moving off in their many hunting patterns. A bulk conveyance slowly lumbered through the skies toward the camp, whipping up the snows beneath it to a small white storm. Another unannounced arrival another annoyance. The peevish deck officer had had enough. This was no machine of war that plied the skies, so he strode towards the landing site to take out some pent-up aggression on the fools who were aboard the vehicle. As the hauler finally hovered over the landing site, a set of doors opened, and the officer barked up his disgruntled first foray in what he hoped would be a veritable tirade of abuse. Who the hell are you? The officer then fell backwards, as multiple huge beings simply leapt out of the half-ajar bays, the hauler not even touching down yet. Each landed with a spray of snow, and the startled officer lost his footing and slipped over in his panic. 
When he looked up, he felt warm and disgusting smelling breath fog the air between them, as a set of huge slathering jaws, easily able to bite off his head in one gulp, were but millimeters from his face. Some form of huge canine. Ha <laughs> ha! What, what, what the hell is that? Floki! The wolf looked into the saucer-wide eyes of the officer, covered his face with spittle as it snorted before turning and heading towards its master. But as the officer let out a slow exhale, he was covered by a shadow as something huge loomed over him, blocking out the sun. Do I smell dung and tears? Oh, I, I, Astartes. Around a mere mortal, five huge power-armoured shapes moved, and the wolf, of course. They wore the holy armour of the Space Marines, the most formidable warriors humanity had ever produced. But to a normal man, taken unawares, they looked like the vilest of evildoers. Each over eight foot tall, each with greying hair or tattoos, all festooned with skins, furs, trinkets. Some even had kill trophies around their necks. To the officer, they looked like barbarians and thugs. But when he saw the sigil on their armour, he could not fear them less. But he also felt a strange warmth in his chest. These were them, the legendary space wolves. And as the other marines stepped up from their landing, the one above him just looked down with a sneer on his lips. One of them addressed him as the rest began to move towards the camp. All right, brothers, let's keep it civil. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Let's just try not to make the little ones wet themselves, eh? One of them looked him dead in the eye and said, We could cut his head off. Another huge warrior stepped next to him and looked down as well, saying, I really agree with Sven the Gentle. The officer whipped his head from one face to another, terrified. An even more grizzled and gnarled face looked down at him, without a sneer, but with absolutely no pity in his eyes. Well, we could, but what would it prove? He knows we could cut his head off, we know we could cut his head off, but if his head is rolling around on the floor, what does he learn? I was saying we could, not that we should, just giving options. I still second this option. I say it should, not could. Alas, as they bantered over his mortality, their proximity so close, the towering form so powerful, the threat so very real in his mind, something happened that he would not regale his children with, nor any of his local mess. The inevitable. He lost control of his bowels. <laughs> Too late. He's not worth killing anymore. Damn, you're gonna go cry now that you've soiled yourself? <laughs> Worthless. I am not getting that all full on my claws. Any of them. The moment over, they all simply sneered and then ignored him and continued on to the camp. The one he least wanted to close, who he later found out was Sven the Gentle, leered down at him and said, Wonderful job on the tactical discharge. Their leader, the one from before, had now arrived and just tapped Sven on the shoulder and he left. The powerful man looked down at the officer and offered his hand to help him rise. The Marine had to practically squat down to make the distance. When both were stood, the Astartes moved slightly, so he was upwind of the officer, then peered down his nose at him and spoke. I won't apologize for my brothers, but I will answer your questions. We have been sent here to hunt down warriors you do not want to face alone. We have been sent here to do what you cannot. The place you are to attack is beyond your scope, unless we are able to remove the marines you did not know are present up there. And you should know. I am not here to protect you, not from the enemy, not from my brothers. We are the Vilka Fenrika. We are the Emperor's own executioners. So watch your step, Captain. 
You do what you are told when you are told and we will get on just fine. Report on everything you know about the enemy. Numbers, equipment, preparedness while we await the arrival of our brethren. But first, go change your britches. Yeah, yes, yes sir. With that, the Space Wolf then joined his brethren, walking towards the campfires, walking towards shelter. They did not need it. They only needed to meet with the legates of terror. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant. And today, we finally get to have a more in-depth look at one of the most loved and feared armies in the entire setting. The Volker Fenrica. The Space Wolves. This guide is an attempt to capture the quintessence of the chapter and in one sitting to project some idea of who they are, what they do, and most importantly of all, why they do it. It will cover the most contemporary basics. For a snapshot of their past, I would refer you to my previous Space Wolves entry, although that may well be expanded on in the future. I shall be quoting from the most recent codices for pure lore and interspersing the continuing tale. As with all of my videos, the tale is there to show, not tell, the nature and wonder of the faction I am trying to present. There will be many nuances that can be explored in the future, but I hope by the end of this entry, you will be able to confidently answer to anyone who asks, do you know anything about the Space Wars? And you will answer, yes. Yes, I do. As with all things in the grim darkness of the far future, there are many sources, oceans of deep lore you will be able to explore through the works of the Black Library, Games Workshop's publishing wing. This is just a start on your journey, but I sincerely hope a good one. And now, let us start at the very beginning, not chronologically, but spiritually. For there is nothing more important to understanding the Space Wars, the Vilka Fenrika, than where they are born and raised, where they call home. The world of Fenris. It is cold. It is always cold. On our world, the frost can skin a man alive, can scorch him to the bone. If you stand still, you die. If you run, you sweat, and the cold freezes it to your body and kills you as surely as an axe between the brows. So you move forward, ever onwards, Never back. If you falter, if you hesitate, if you twist from your path, you are dead. No matter the adversity, no matter the hunger, no matter the pain. For when the air itself is cold enough to make a man a statue, there is only one answer, one recourse. To have a heart of fire that sends lava like blood down your veins. For when the very world is your enemy, it's every cloud, it's every snowdrift, it's every mountain and all that lurk within. When you have to fight every day, every hour, every second just to survive, then to be a man or woman of fairness is to be a warrior born. Named after the great wolf of Nordic mythology, a place where battles are constantly fought and legends formed. The world of Fenris is among the most deadly places in the galaxy. It is like a dream, a thing of mystery. Yet the mind and soul that must have been its conjurer are obviously troubled indeed. Officially named a death world by the Imperium, the title is not given lightly. For one may look at Fenris and think it is merely a planet of ice and snow, much akin to Rogel Dawn's world of landing, Inward. And there is a great kinship between the sons of the great wolf, Lehman Ras, and the sons of Rogel, the Imperial Fist. They have many similarities. Both are fiercely loyal, utterly devoted to their cause, 
and without even the slightest give. But that is where the similarity ends. For where Rogel and his sons are the epitome of cold hanger, a reflection of their heritage on Inuit, the sons of Lehman Russ, the Volker Fenrica, the Space Wolves, are red hot rage personified. The kind that can explode at any time and consume all in its path. Where the Praetorian of Terror, Rogel, is discipline and stoicism, coldly aloof, some might say. Lehman was ever the fire that burns also oh very brightly. Where the Imperial Fists endure the cold and endless struggle with their legendary stoicism and restraint, for the sons of Lehman, all things are based on passion, be it camaraderie or rage, the space wars never blow cool. And it is the birthplace of the Volker Fenrica that forges these marines and their chapter as much as the genes of their sire. For Fenris is not like Inwit. Fenris, in this guard's opinion, is far, far worse. The world of Fenris cycles around its sun, like all do, but its trajectory and orbit are not calm and steady as those of Inuit. As it goes further from its star's reach, the world of Fenris freezes, even the oceans to a large extent. In the long months of winter, it is a barren and terrible place, where food is rare, shelter inconsistent, and resources incredibly finite. And in the dark of night, enemies are abound. The human tribes of Fenris are a proud and rugged people, for they must be, for everything on their world is a dire threat. There are beasts that stalk the oceans called Kraken, be so large that their name is not hyperbolic, with an insatiable hunger that cannot be matched. They are known to be a part of the tyranny genetic strain, their mere existence heralds that all that is known about the highs and the chronology of their invasion, the causes for it, are far more complicated than one may believe. Certainly more so than is presently accepted, though this nuance is for another time. All that one needs to know is that the Great Deep Ones, the Kraken, are just one of the threats on Fenris. So wonderful is the location, location, location. The entire planet is like a retelling of the tales of mighty Odin and Thor, Loki, and all that come with it. For in fairness, all beasts are predators, or the most tough of prey able to resist them. Fenrisian wolves are huge, their thunder wolf cousins more so. Both variants aggressive and able to kill a man with ease, let alone as a pack. And there be ice worms. White-furred lizards of colossal size that are named after flightless dragons for a reason. When they arise to hunt, entire communities need tremble. Ice fiends, akin to yeti in description, size and aggression are there also. Trolls, standing taller than a dreadnought, semi-sentient tribes of horrors that walk constantly on the human clans. Great white bears are able to push tanks over and tear any that fall out into strips of meat for their moors and this is just the beginning of the troubles. For everything and everyone on Fenris is constantly hunting, constantly battling, constantly hoarding food for the times of upheaval, or just for the most pure and simple reason of all, hunger. For the nature of the summers brings scarcity and peril so large that despite their racial kinship, the humans of Fenris will wage frantic wars of annihilation on one another. As Fenris approaches summer and travels closer to its star, the world is turned upside down. For the star will burn away much of the ice, start volcanic activity in the crust that will see entire regions of the sea thaw and then the waters boil. This period they do not call summer, it is dubbed the season of fire. Entire land masses of ice will disappear and others rise up as the volcanic and tectonic activity erupts. There is actually only one real continent on the whole of Fenris, the land called Azaheim. The rest are temporary land masses that could be there for a season, could be there for a decade or a century. Nobody is ever sure. So all constructions outside of Azaheim are temporary by necessity. The season of fire can make tribes war on each other, cause migrations of trolls and worms and bears. All move as land rises and falls, and this, of course, creates frantic warfare for all, as old lands sink and new ones must be claimed almost every year. 
a life of constant aquatic nomadic existence punctuated by brutal and terrible swift wars, and a lot of near awe on Ferris. And perhaps in the future we shall explore this further, but now is not the time. Just let it be known that this is how the use of Fenris are raised, how they grow, how they are forged. The world of Fenris forms the space walls just as much as Chugoris does the White Scars. Thus it is that when one of their youths are chosen to be an aspirant of the Volk of Fenrica, that they are already a hardened warrior, a merciless killer, and a weapon already sharpened to a razor's edge. But this place of war, this proving ground that is their entire world, it makes men who are as attuned to their senses as is possible. For they must act without hesitation, without restraint, to survive. Thus is every second of existence a struggle high, but also a gift. For only the strong can survive, and in the knowledge of this, that they are the strong, the people of Fenris can celebrate, as only those one minute away from death at all times can, without restraint. They are a rugged and honest people, because there is no time for subtlety, no place for timidity. Honour is all, and a man or woman's worth is self-evident, and through action, not words. They truly live life to the fullest, being always one slip from the grave at all times. And it is this spirit of fire, this frantic zeal and zest for life, that is what is epitomised in their bravest and boldest warriors. The aspirants, who will eventually become the Sky Warriors, the Space Wolves. The Fang. As stated, there is one static landmass on Fenris, but one. And it is here that the fortress monastery of the Volca Fenrica stands. Known across the Imperium of Man as the Fang, the peoples of Fenris call it the Aet. It stands on the highest mountain of Azerheim, upon its tallest peak. Based on the mountain known as the shoulder of the Allfather, Voldehamarki, the world spine in low Gothic. It is a place of power, unlike any of its kind. For the very mountains about its sides and approaches are festooned with concealed weaponry, with defense lasers powerful enough to blast orbiting fleets to scrap, and nests, traps, turrets, and hard points enough to defeat near any attacking army. The Fang is known to be one of, if not the, most impregnable place outside of the Sol system and the Imperial Palace on Terror. It is so huge and lofty that battle barges and ships of the line can dock there amidst the clouds, and it has been attacked by some of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, Magnus the Red amongst them, and still stood. And despite how many defenses there are, no matter how grand, it has always been the Space Wolves themselves that have finished any assault in the only way it could end. With the Volcafane record victorious. But again, these are sagas that must wait for their own telling, so important are they. In Azerheim, it is also where there are the training camps for those who would attempt to prove that they are worthy of becoming Sky Warriors. One of the greatest soldiers of all of humanity. The Space Wolves. To quote, Sky Warrior Training Camps Located in the lowlands of the mountainous polar Azerheim continent are a series of remote training camps where potential aspirants to the chapter undergo a series of intensive trials to prove themselves worthy to join the chapter. Ruzvik, Grimnir, Volksberg and other sites like them are where the young tribesmen chosen by the wolf priests are brought to begin their training. For solar months, the aspirants endure extreme hardships and training that tests them to their very limits, both mentally and physically. The young tribesmen are forced to put aside the greatest differences of their old tribal identities and learn to work and fight together in groups that will in time become the packs with which they will most likely serve for the rest of their lives. Should an aspirant survive this training, he will be taken to the Fang to face the trials of Morkai. Should he pass those, he will then begin the gene seed implantation process and go through the blooding that will transform him from a scrawny youth dragged from the ice into a transhuman killing machine of the Adeptus Astartes. Concerning Primaris Space Marines The Kinpak Declaration 
It was Logan Grimner, after Gallerman had departed Fenris, who formally voiced this recognition. Though some were not of Fenris, all were scions of the Wolf King. Perhaps not since the ill-fated second founding of the Wolf Brothers chapter had such considerations been taken. Not only had Gallerman instigated official successors to the Space Wars, but he had furnished them with the varied armor types and squad doctrines developed by himself and Call. If Gallerman had hoped that such gifts would bend Fenrisian tactical independence towards his ultramarian ideal, he would be frustrated. Part of Grimnar's declaration was the full incorporation of these packs into the Space Wolves' creed. Irrespective of their codex assigned strategic designation, each pack took its place within the traditional structure. Defined weapons, loadouts, and tactics were assigned to each stage of a pack's progression. Blood Claws, Grey Hunters, and Long Fangs. As well as to the chapter's packs of Wolf Scouts and Wolf Guard. Thus, for example, the Grimnard proclaimed that Grey Hunters would fight as suppressors, and that Wolf Scouts would take up arms as eliminators. He would not abandon the ancient customs, for their upholding was a responsibility of the Great Wolf. The declaration was spread to the newly founded successor chapters of Russ's bloodline, bonding those that would recruit from other worlds. Nonetheless, independence of spirit is ever strong within all the sons of Russ. Thus individual packs, whole great companies, and even entire chapters steadfastly apply the declaration in their own way. Just as new tactics and squad types were absorbed and recrafted, so too were the new arms, armor, and technology of Kor's design integrated into the chapter's culture by the Iron Priests. These technos events would shape Kor's works to befit the Space War's needs. Blood Claws After enduring the physical transformation and psycho-indoctrination that turns the tribesmen of Fenris into Space Wolves, new recruits are placed into packs where their native savagery and hunger to prove themselves is put to its greatest use. Known as Blood Claws, these warriors are fiercely aggressive without exception, and, having not long ago left their glory-hunting tribal roots, will plunge headlong into battle against maniacs and monsters alike. The berserker charges of the Blood Claws are infamous across Imperial space, for they still believe in their own invincibility, and continually dare the galaxy to prove them wrong. Despite the bellicose cultures from which they are drawn, the Blood Claws have far less exposure to combat than their veteran battle brothers, many of whom have fought the galaxy's greatest horrors for centuries. But what Blood Claws lack in experience, they make up for in confidence and belligerent enthusiasm, a product of their excitement at having ascended to the ranks of the fabled Sky Warriors. They know that not only do they tread in the footsteps of giants, but they have also been given the chance to become true heroes themselves. The intoxicating effect this knowledge has upon the Blood Claws, often compounded by a barrel of mead or two, makes for a fine line between their acts of heroism and those of reckless foolhardiness. A Blood Claw would not hesitate to swing onto the tusks of a charging Squigoth and hack away at its eyes, or to run under a Tyranid bio-monster and try and open its belly from underneath, despite the likelihood he would be crushed in its death throes. After all, if his gamble pays off, he will have made a name for himself, come to the attention of the Wolf Lord, and begun his own personal saga. The Elder Space Wars that watch over the development of the Blood Claws believe that the best training ground of all is the white-hot fury of the battlefield. Not for the Sons of Rus the predictable logic of the practice cage or assault corridor, for they reason that it is very unlikely they will be attacked by semi-intelligent autosystems on the field of battle. Instead, they concentrate on fighting foes of flesh and blood. After all, the Space Wolves are never afraid to start a fight, and what better way to perfect the arts of battle than from direct experience? So it is that the Blood Claws are not discouraged from taking up their favorite position at the vanguard of the great companies, whilst their elders watch carefully for those who show true talent and cunning. Unfortunately, the Blood Claws lack the patience of their Grey Hunter brethren, and their glory hunty ethos frequently leads them to bite off more than they can chew. It is not unusual to see a Blood Claw pack race forward to engage the commanders or champions of the enemy army, sometimes with disastrous results. 
For this reason, blood claws are often led by a wise and experienced wolf guard, whose role it is to curb the worst excesses of the youngster's berserker battle lusts, with barked commands and the occasional punch in the face. Blood claw packs are often fielded with enough warriors in their ranks to sustain a few casualties and still prevail. To the Fenrisian mindset, the first few deaths suffered by any pack are a vital process that sorts the strong from the weak. Lapses of martial discipline are usually overlooked by the pack's wolfguard mentor until after the battle, for he knows that with the proper guidance, the savagery of a blood claw charge can turn the tide of a battle in the space of a few gore-splattered minutes. Since the induction of Primera Space Marines into the Great Companies, many blood claws have instigated snarling confrontations with the new breed of Sky Warriors. Hostilities are voiced openly, as blood claws fiercely resent the fact that Primera Space Marines are not born of Fenris and have not proven themselves in tribal battle. The fires of anger are only further stoked by the bestial instinct the blood claws are yet to fully master. To prevent such confrontations ending with battle brothers tearing each other apart, the Wolf Lords have implemented ritual unarmed combats that are halted before becoming fatal. In this way, both parties are able to unleash their aggression and can see firsthand their opponent is indeed a worthy warrior. Swift Claws Swift Claw Biker Packs are formed when the chapter needs a fast, mobile strike force that can plunge like a spear into a vital part of the enemy army, and the battle hungry temperament of the Blood Claws is perfectly suited to the role. As such, there are rarely any objections when a blood claw is seconded to a swift claw pack. Swift claws know as well as their commanders that the role of the biker pack is to sow the maximum amount of carnage and disruption possible, a task to which young space wolves traditionally apply themselves with great relish. Some new recruits are so taken by the longer leash afforded to them, not to mention the opportunities for raising havoc that come along with it, that they demand the right to a permanent position as a swift claw. There is something intoxicating about the raw speed and power of the Space Marine bike. Though other chapters use their biker units primarily for forward reconnaissance, in the Space Wolves this is a task honed to perfection by the Wolf Scouts. Instead, the Space Wolves use their bikes in a demolitions and close assault role. There is little mileage in expecting a pack of young Space Wolves to stay out of the fight, but if you need something blown up or killed in a spectacular fashion, there are few finer operatives amongst their Diplus Astartes. This is not to say that they are without skill or cunning. Occasionally a swift core pack will undertake a dangerous quest that they and they alone can fulfill. This might be to navigate the winding chasms of a death world in the arrow swift pursuit of a hated traitor, to rescue a fallen chapter relic from a nest of tyranids, or to avenge the grisly death of an old mentor. Because of their supernaturally acute senses, a fully equipped swift claw biker pack can track its quarry across hostile terrain for months on end if necessary, sniffing out the unmistakable tang of fearless sweat on the breeze. Their former lives as nomads and hunters mean that even the least experienced recruit is an expert at survival, living off the land on melted ice, bark root, and the raw meat of prey animals they run down on the hunt. As such, a swift claw pack can last months without supply. Much like the Fenrisian wolves that frequently accompany them on the hunt, swift claw packs have near endless stamina and would rather die than give up the chase. If no other supplies are available, they can at least be sure of a good meal once their target has been taken down. When they finally find their quarry, a swift claw biker pack will release its pent up aggression in a savage display of violence and destruction. This can be achieved by the use of chainswords, bundles of crack grenades, or a storm of synchronized bolt of fire, the swift claws care not, so long as the kill is showy and spectacular. A favorite tactic is to set alight their enemy's refuge and then ride straight through the burning walls into the inner sanctum, twin bolt guns blazing and war cries upon their lips. After all, nothing whets the appetite for a violent kill more than several weeks spent bringing the foe to bay. It is no wonder that the swift claw packs are so ready to power forward into the midst of the enemy, spitting in the face of death as they carve their reputations from the flesh of the hated foe. Sky Claws The most headstrong troublemakers from each blood core pack are awarded <laughs> by reassignment to a Sky Claw assault pack. 
They are entrusted with a jump pack so that they might better indulge their desire to plunge headlong into battle. Let the youngsters slack their reckless bloodthirst, joked the elders of the Space Wars. And if they die in the process, the surviving packmates will learn a valuable lesson. The promotion to Skyclaw is seen as a dubious honour at best by more mature brethren, not because of the heightened risk of a quick and violent death, but because if fighting on foot was good enough for their Primarch, it's good enough for them too. Such disapproval just makes the Skyclaws more determined to prove themselves in the eyes of their elders. They soar fearlessly through the skies in great leaps, landing with a stone-splattered crunch before rocketing straight forward into the ranks of the foe. With their fangs gnashing, chainsaws roaring, and their bolt pistols slaying those beyond the reach of their blades, the Skycorals rejoice in seeing the enemy crumble under the reckless fury of their airborne assault. The Skyclaws are truly the most rebellious and free-spirited of all the Space Wars. Contests of athletic prowess are common between packs of Bloodclaw and Skyclaws, as well as drinking and eating competitions that test their enhanced constitutions to the limit. These contests inevitably end in some of the participants seeking out a wolf priest for absolution and hasty ministrations. Fond of practical jokes, these incorrigible show-offs are not above stealing a Thunderhawk to careen through the armoured fjords of Fenris at breakneck speeds, racing each other to outrun an avalanche, or at a victory feast, quite literally delivering the enemy commander's head on a platter to their wolf lord. Although transgressions that cost the lives of their fellows are punished severely, even the grizzled wolf lords themselves were young ones, and so Skyclaws are rarely exiled for their reckless deeds. After all, None can deny that the antics of each Skyclaw pack make for entertaining stories around the fireside, with much cheering and toasting to the few participants still alive. However, there is a dark side to the rebellious frivolity that is associated with the Skyclaws. As with all serious transgressors against the unspoken law of Ras, those few who push their luck too far and commit offence anathema to their chapter are assigned a punishment to fit the crime. One who has caused the death of a senior member of the Space Wars may be struck down, only to wake up to a new life as a med servitor. Not all of the sagas of the Sons of Ras end in glory. Skyclaws hold that they can defeat any foe in their known galaxy, and because of this self-belief it is quite possible that they are correct. Fenris has bred into them ferocity and independence. The chapter has bestowed upon them strength beyond the dreams of mortal man, Better still, the Skyclaws say, the Iron Priests have entrusted them with not only an arsenal of weapons, but also the power of flight. And what prey can hope to evade a predator with such a gift? Grey Hunters Only when a Blood Corps has emerged victorious from the ferocious conflagrations of war do the Wolfguard consider him for promotion into the ranks of the Grey Hunters. It is the Grey Hunters who comprise the main body of each great company. Though they are as hungry for honour as any of their younger brethren, their raw aggression has been tempered by experience. Every space marine knows that finely honed cunning is a better weapon than the keenest blade, and with oaths of brotherhood to bind them fast in the face of impossible odds, each grey hunter pack can be a small army in its own right. As a space wars warrior becomes older and increasingly more experienced in the art of war, the genetic flaw born within his Canix Helix begins to manifest physically as well as mentally. The transition from aspirant to fully-fledged Grey Hunter may take decades or even centuries, but should a Bloodclaw not find his death upon the battlefield, that transition is all but certain. Hair begins to grey and fangs to lengthen, skin becomes ever more tanned and leathery and, in extreme cases, eyes yellow and transmute until they are more like those of the wolf. These are all signs that the individual has come into his heritage as a strong and mature battle brother at the peak of his powers, truly worthy of the name Grey Hunter. The rest of the Imperium may abhor such widespread mutation, but the Space Wolves know that a Grey Pelt is a mark of the true warrior. Reliable, patient and cunning, Grey Hunters can be counted upon to hold their objectives against hordes of murderous assailants until they stand ankle-deep in spent bolter casings charging forward with pistol and blade only if the enemy breaks through their firestorm or, more likely, the hunters have slaughtered so many of the foe that they have run out of ammunition entirely. 
But it is on the attack that these battle-hardened warriors truly excel. The Grey Hunters bear their name for a reason. They track their prey with the cunning and patience of the wolf. Pack after pack moves forward in turn, bolters raised, laying down impeccably executed fire patterns that force the enemy to seek cover. Only when their brethren are in place will the trap be sprung. As a great howling roar rises above the thunderous cannonade of massed bolt fire, the Grey Hunters close in for the kill, and another day is won in the name of Russ. Wolf Scouts Fenrisians are usually a sociable and gregarious lot, but there are those amongst them that are said to have the spirit of Lokyar, the great lone wolf. These souls are content only when roaming the virgin snow, following the scent of prey and chasing the promise of bloodshed. When such an individual is inducted into the Space Marines, they do not share the easy camaraderie and charisma of their fellow warriors. Quiet, brooding, and with a broad murderous streak, these warriors are ill-suited to the bonds of brotherhood formed by a traditional Space Wars pack. However, their sly cunning makes them hunters and trackers of unsurpassed skill, and they are branded together into Wolf Scout packs. Wolf Scouts are usually drawn from the ranks of the Grey Hunters after learning the fundamentals of warfare and carry bolt guns in battle. Depending on the prey they are tasked with hunting, they are also equipped with sniper rifles, Astarte shotguns, combat blades or a number of other specialist weapons. Each Wolf Scout is clad in carapace armor and Dura cloth fatigues, usually embellished with trophies and pelts of personal significance. He has also issued a variety of grenades, so that he can swiftly disable any target. But the true weapons of a Wolf Scout are patience and guile. Packs of Wolf Scouts operate far in advance of their fellows, snuffing out the forces of the foe, infiltrating fortified positions, and stalking and killing isolated targets. Long Fangs some Space Wolves are canny enough to survive for centuries of active service in the name of the Allfather. Though their individual sagas are long and filled with bloody deeds, each has earned wisdom and insight from innumerable battlefields, and their collective skills are too valuable to throw away upon a blood-soaked assault. These packs of inveterate warriors become long fangs. Steady of hand and temperament, entrusted not only with the protection of their brethren, but also the heaviest of weapons used by the sons of Ras. Longfangs are dour and grizzled individuals, having survived long enough for the genetic inheritance of the Canis Helix to manifest fully. They are literally endowed with long fangs, for as they age, the canines of the space wolves continually lengthen, and their beards grow thick. In their youth, they hungered for honor just like their brethren, each eager to earn his place in the tales of the skulls. Now, after countless long wars, their esteem stands tall as a mountain, commanding awe and respect from those of lesser years. With long and glorious sagas, the hot steel of youth has been tempered by honor and pragmatism, leaving warriors as finely balanced as the keenest blade. Most Bloodclaws and Grey Hunters die in battle, with only a minority surviving to reach a venerable age but those that do are amongst the most redoubtable warriors in the galaxy. Having emerged victorious from bitter wars fought in both the material universe and beyond the veil, Longfangs remain implacably composed even when fighting in the most nightmarish conditions. Their once numerous pack, now whittled down to but a handful of veterans, are so tight-knit that they fight as one often conversing casually or calmly, placing bets with each other as they mow the enemy down with salvos of devastating firepower. This solid and reliable demeanor is precisely why Longfangs excel in their role, and by their fire are monstrous beasts and battle tanks laid low. The oldest Longfang of the pack is entrusted with target selection and directs his brethren's fire where it will do the most harm. These pack leaders can anticipate the flow of battle with uncanny prescience, enabling their men to function more efficiently than a conventional Devastator squad. When the Space Wolves are outnumbered by a living tide of Tyranids, or standing in the path of a thundering Orc battle wagon, it is the Longfangs that redress the balance. Wolfguard The Wolfguard are the hand-picked battle brothers that fight alongside each great company's Wolflord, 
Each has earned his place by some exceptional feat of arms. It is his heroic deeds that mark the Wolfguard rather than his age. So there are hot-headed young warriors as well as sturdy veterans amongst their ranks. Every Space Wolves warrior dreams of a place in the Wolfguard and will battle even harder when a Wolf Lord is nearby in the hope that he may earn the right to join this legendary brotherhood. Other than earning the respect of a Lord of a great company, there are no specific criteria for elevation to the ranks of the Wolfguard. Battlefield promotion is extremely common, for Wolf Lords are men of conviction and instinct. A badly wounded warrior surrounded by the broken bodies of alien terrors many times his size may see a Wolf Lord nodding approvingly in his direction. Or the lone warrior surviving a war waged deep within the Eye of Terror may fight his way across the stars to find a new role waiting for him upon his return to Fenris. Perhaps the surest way to join the Wolf Guard is to save the life of a Wolf Lord in the heat of battle. After all, it is the sacred duty of the Wolf Guard to be the sword and shield of their Lord, and many have already proved their abilities in that field beyond doubt. When they are not cutting through scores of enemy warriors alongside their Wolf Lord, Battle Brothers of the Wolf Guard act as his war council. They will advise their Lord on matters of strategy contributing their cumulative centuries of battlefield experience. Such sage wisdom is priceless, for even the most brilliant battlefield commanders are not immune to rash decisions. Many times the caution of a wise old white beard has tempered a wolf lord's kill last at a delicate stage of battle, preventing a deadly enemy ambush. The non-codified structure of a wolf guard stretches to the equipment that each warrior carries, Every wolf lord favours his chosen brethren with the best armaments he has at his disposal, antique weapons of immense potency and ornate artefacts of ancient origin. These weapons are both badges of distinction and tools to enable each wolf guard to further excel in his preferred fighting style. Wolf Guard Terminators Upon ascending to the wolf guard, many warriors continue to favour the war gear they used in their former roles as blood claws, grey hunters, or long fangs. Yet others find it impossible to resist the lure of war power afforded by tactical dreadnought armour. To wear such a priceless relic of the chapter's grand history is an honour few space wolves will ever experience. So it is that a wolf lord will often be accompanied into battle by a brotherhood of hulking, nigh invulnerable champions, each ready to give his life for his lord and eager to dispense his own particular brand of death. Each suit of Terminator armor is a priceless relic from the Imperium's glorious past, able to shrug off anti-armor weaponry and small arms fire alike with contemptuous ease. The Space Wolves maintain a number of these artifacts, reserved only for the Wolf Lord and his guard. Each is bedecked with runes, totems and trophies, marks of honor gained by its wearer over long years of battle. Pelts and hides taken from Xenos monsters or Fenrisian beasts are often draped across the suit's broad shoulder plates. Presence of Wolfguard Terminators upon the battlefield can change the tide of war. They fight as the spearhead of the assault, enemy fire deflecting harmlessly from their relic armor as they stride forward to tear the throat from the foe. Those foolish enough to step close are sliced to bloody chunks by power claws or obliterated by a single swing of a crackling thunder hammer. Any other targets are destroyed by the finest heavy weapons in the Great Company's arsenal. Enormous heavy flamers, assault cannons, and the dreaded cyclone missile launcher. On rare occasions, when a sledgehammer blow is required to crush the life from a particularly resilient foe, a wolf lord will decide to deploy his entire wolf guard in Terminator armor. Such a force shakes the earth beneath its relentless advance, butchering all in its path with implacable ferocity. End quote. Only two hours later, the legates of Terra arrived in their impulses. Great hovering transports that were able to float off the ground using anti-gravity technology. The first innovation in a very long time. Millennia. Tech heresy, many would say. As new as the marines who they carried. A newly forged chapter straight after the Indomitus Crusade, 
ultramarine stock, hardy and disciplined, by the book, but actually more adaptable than the Sons of Russ would have usually accredited such a chapter. It would seem that the regent actually asked his sons to now look beyond the confines of the Codex Astartes, and the legates did just that. The Hrad had cost them dearly, but they were as mentally robust as their steely coiled muscles. New, but rooted in the past, but still new. A half dozen of the vehicles landed at the camp, and Lieutenant Darnick Steven stepped out. They had brought intercessors, hellbasters, and eliminators to the hunting party. Towering over the space marines by a few feet at least, uniform warplate, uniform war gear. The pack was only four strong, but they were veterans. They were wolf guard to a man. Crom Weirdfang, the young buck. Kargir Darkhowl, its most venerable member. Sven the Gentle, most violent of men, a berserker. And their pack leader, Dolph Thunderclaw, obviously named after his pair of claws. Dolph was calm and seemed relaxed compared to his pack, but he had a glint in his eye, always the whisper of a wry smile on his face, and the solidity of his stance and glare enough to make any pause in their tracks. Ever was Floki at his side, the huge and aggressive cyberwolf that seemed to do his growling for him. To watch the real mood of the pack leader was to take stock of his wolf, Floki. In nominal command, Olaf Stormbrow, their wolf priest. He had one task and one task alone, the recovery of the gene seed of the Ironhearts. But of them all, it was he that would be most able to carve a sway through all present. A Crozius, in the hands of wolf priest of his standing. They were all armed to the teeth, and not one piece of armor was the same from one to another. All their arms were mighty indeed. Krom's frost axe, Kargir's frost sword and combi melter. Dos claws and Sven the gentle's huge two-headed axe that hit with the same force as a thunder hammer. The two forces met and nodded more than spoke, but after an hour of refueling, the legates of Terra then indicated that they were going to take their transports to the designated area. The pack could all sense it, but Krom acted as the mouthpiece, and Kargir played along as usual. Storm's coming. Yep. The pack leader nodded. Got you. Then went to his opposite number, Sergeant Bron Faure of the Legates of Terra. The refueling of the impulses was concluded, and the Primaris began to board them. He didn't listen, did he? Great. Just great. These idiots won't even make it. As they all stood, shaking their heads and blatantly sneering at the Legates, Dolph broke it up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Either way, it doesn't change the amount of ground we have to cross in a storm. Let's be at it. As the legates sped away, most looked forward and up towards the distant passes where their targets were hidden. But Capita, the most recent addition to the Eliminators, looked back. The space wars all just began, the loping jog of the marines went off at the double. They bounded through the snow like they were born to it. As the light bounced off the icy vision, the distance blurring. He was so sure that he saw how they moved. It must have been a mirage, a trick of the light. For in the last moments, he was so sure that he saw them moving so low as to use their hands on the ground at points. And the speed. It must have been the light. They had been right, of course. Damn them, thought Capito. He had overheard the wolf sergeant, or pack leader, talking to Faure and Dolph's prediction had been self-fulfilling, it seemed. Because here they were, two hours out at their very minimum, wading through the ice and snow. The storm had come in so hard, so fast, so furious, that they had to disembark and hike. The impulsors had as much visibility as the marines of the Legates of Terra, as they did not wish to send off war spec scans to alert the renegade eternal champions to their advent. It meant that they could not proceed in the vehicles, Slogging would be faster. So they did. They would be hours later than projected. It seemed that, again, the Space Wolves' estimation of attacking at dawn was more accurate. When the Legates arrived near the base of the mountain atop which the target was, they slowed, became more cautious. 
As they crept forward, it was an utter shock when two mounds of ice burst upward. Crumb Weird Fang was in the middle of one of the eruptions, sweeping two of the forward intercessors straight off their feet. The other had the huge cyberwolf, Floki, in its midst. But at this, Ron Fare leveled his bolt rifle and prepared to fire. Only a breath between the two motions, but his gun was knocked up, and a shorter but seemingly much wider marine barked up at him. You do not shoot my wolf. Floki, calm down. Why? Why the ambush? Barked Brond. Now get it together, we had to let you come in close to make sure it was you. We've made camp halfway, we're here to bring you up the rest of the way. You're lucky we pulled our punches. We could have gunned you all down if we were not so controlled. Sure, sure you could. Let's go. The cave was expansive and had many a corner and turn before the main room, so to put it. In this way, it was possible with minor netting to negate any light leaking out. Not that they expected the oblivious Eternal Champions to notice a thing. Certainly not any sound. The storm had come in even thicker and the gale force was deafening to all. So, with hours until it broke and dawn close, the marines rested. Prepared. Well, the legates seemed to want to do this. The space wolves, less so. They had made one large fire, about which there was space for all if they sat backwards somewhat. The officers of both forces sat in a corner speaking softly about the day to come, around their own microfire. The legates had eaten the hot meal that the most violent of men, Sven the Gentle, had made. But now they sat back, more watching the wolves than talking amongst themselves. For the wolves had begun to talk more boisterously, and took it in turns to perform their little parts. <laughs> well, we all remember how I slaughtered the fiend of Barnard Four. No? My bolt pistol? Its range was spent. Its maw smoking from the hate it had unleashed on our foes. A line of Xenos lay at its longest range, none escaping its one evil eye and barked shout. But this was just the beginning. As the Xeno saw me holster it, I widened my stance, took out my chainsword, and gestured them to me like this. His hand out flat, the fingers then bending back in a beckoning action twice. All the while, Kagir grinned an evil grin that showed off his canines in the firelight. Even they knew what this meant, and I did not have to wait long. <laughs> Two score and five of them, if not more, charged at me, and I ran to meet them. My first hacks took down the front three of them, one in the shoulder, taking off his arm, the other two with a sidelong slash that left them a head shorter. They were armed with vicious gem-tipped spikes, and they began to try to hem me in, two appearing from either side, four to my front. The rest waited to see what I would do. I already had them shaking in their britches. One of them managed to dip forward, and I allowed him to stab me in the arm to see if they could pierce my war plate. I was right. My nose always is. As it slid through and nicked me before I snatched it off him and pulled the owner towards me, his guts spilled across the floor as I then used him as a shield to barrel into the two to my left. I killed both before I rose, one with a throat chop, snapping his neck like a twig, and the other I headbutted and his skull shattered like an egg being run over by a land raider. This put many of them to flight, which was disappointing. <laughs> but the fight was just about to get interesting, because these ones were only the warm-up. When a twelve-foot monster came out and spat in my direction, I knew I had found the fiend. And this is how I came out of that cave wearing his skin as a cape. 
You never saw a skin cape so beautiful. I loved every minute of it. I basked in the glory that was mine. I sung a saga all day long. As Kage continued, the two officers sat hunched over their small fire. Lieutenant Stevens said, May I ask you a question? One officer to another. No. But as a brother, always. Mm. Your culture is loud and seems to many as bluster. Your men seem to mine as braggers. Olaf smiled to himself warmly, allowing the other man to know there was no hatred for the question. You were the oldest and most revered of chapters, first founding. Have fought before there was even an Imperium, and every one of the ten thousand years or more since those days. You have not done this through luck. Explain it to me. This cultural boisterousness. We are the sons of the Rus. Combat is as much air to us as it is to you, brother. But so is joy. We honestly and truly love what we do. We are not psychopaths and blood-drenched butchers like the traitorous world eaters. We are not the horrors that are the night lords who savour pain as a fine wine and the cries of the weak as a symphony. But we will always feel most alive when in the midst of battle. In the red time, the mist descending, the hackles risen and the teeth clenched, ready for the bite to come. More than this, the battlefield is our calling, our doom, our destiny, and our pride. Like it is for all Marines, you and yours as much as we. But has it ever occurred to your men, to you, that it is these hours right here, these moments of comradeship, of family, of being amongst your pack, your blood, your kin? Has it never occurred to you that these are also the truest moments to savour? For what do we fight for, if not for moments like these? For family, for brothers, for kin. For our lords, our emperor, our primarch, and, as the salamanders would also say, for our people. And if that is so, then what is it not to be proud of? Why would your heart not sing and send fire down your veins at the merest fault of destroying the enemies of our people? And if that is so, then why would you not celebrate the events, the battles you have already won? Why would you not regale your brothers with your deeds? The wolf priest nodded towards his troops still not looking at the other officer. For when they speak, all you hear is words, intent. But that is not our way. When we speak, you must listen to the lesson, to the warning, to the implied, never the direct alone. For we are the sons of the Rus. Nobody has ever or will ever question our loyalty or our skill. So why do we sing our songs, tell our tales? Why do we state the aims of the next day? You hear brags, I hear oaths of moment. I hear promises to the Rus and to the Emperor and to all of humanity that we will rain horror and death down on the enemies of our people. You hear unlikely talk of hundreds of enemies bested and heroes slain. You think them tall tales, but I hear of a reassurance for your men to know that those they fight alongside tomorrow are indeed what they say they are. They are trying to set your men's fears to peace by telling them of their calibre. They are trying to engender the fire for the battle so your men will feel no fear. 
They are trying to kindle the fire for battle, so your men will feel no fear. But more than this, they are telling your men that this is a competition, but a friendly one. But a friendly one. Tomorrow we must best men who were once our brothers, but though they be kinslayers and scum, they are still Astartes, marines, and that is no small thing, brother. While my men laugh and bluster, your men do not fall into the hole of considering this too deeply. My men are defending yours by ignoring the previous error and acting what you think normal to show they have forgotten the errors of the day. They talk by the fire and offer your men warm food to show they are with them, not against them. Then throwing down the gauntlet. Healthy. Very. This is our way. To enjoy the moments we can. To savour the battles to come. To live every second of our lives knowing that, if done right, lived well. Every single moment contributes to not only our own saga, but that of our chapter, that of all Astartes, and the greater glory of our entire race. He signalled he was done by sipping slowly on his drink. He did not look at the other marine once while talking, knowing what he would see. He now glanced over and, yes, as always, it was there. The look of restrained shock, a slowly dawning realization that everything they thought they knew about the Space Wars was utterly and totally wrong. Stefan had the other look as well, the one all initiates do. It could only be called awe. To break the tension, to bring the shine off slightly, the priest then burped so loudly it echoed round the chamber, before wiping his mouth with his arm while winking at the other man and saying, or, they're just loudmouths who talk a good fight. Only the events of the morrow will decide. Action in three hours, brother. Prepare your men, as we have outlined. The moment was shattered, and they were equals again. But it was a night that none of the legates of terror would ever forget. Mostly because of what happened next. Ho, oh, Kagia, a mighty tale. Now, have I recently told you of my battle against the Bullman of Bolton Secondus? I get the feeling you were going to if we like it or not, said Fare. Then prepare to learn a trick or two, if you take the stick out of your backside. We could cut his head off. Again, I second this. Oh, could you? Stated Bron Fare, rising and bristling. Sven leapt to his feet in a flash, looking like he was about to take a step forward. Oh, gentle, leave it. They're tired. We're all friends here. Are we? Unlikely friends, it seems. All I have heard is bluster and bragging. I find any of this hard to believe. Did you just call my packmate a liar? Gentle. Take it how you wish. And this. Dolph stood up and squared up to the taller man, but for some reason, he did not seem the smaller. Okay, that's enough from you two, Sergeant. Sit down. Or what, Tiny? Direct challenge. At this, Crom and Kargir bounded up. Gentle, if you don't do it, I'm going to rip his head off. My turn, brother. Surely it's my turn. Enough. Shut up. The leader barked at his pack and all silenced. Okay, Sergeant, we accept. We? Yes, we. Your squad against our pack. What? We outnumber you twice over. And you will learn that that means absolutely zero to us, boy. But you will learn it tomorrow, when we all kill the enemies of the Allfather, together. And when we're done, 
Then, and only then, will we enact the acceptance of your challenge. When the enemy is dead, then we can settle this, but not one second sooner. Our oath of vengeance against the Eternal Champions is more important than putting you and your squad in its place. Now that it's settled, I suggest you all stand down and concentrate on getting your sorry carcasses through this. The Wolf Priest turned to the Lieutenant and said quietly, Ugh. An unfortunate situation, to be sure. Aye. But this changes nothing. We destroy the Eternal Champions. We deal with what's left when we see what's left. Sagas of the Sky Warriors There is no glory without danger. So do the Space Wolves approach the myriad terrors of the galaxy, as opportunities for valor, as obstacles to overcome, and as tests for the daring. There is no foe they are unwilling to stare down. There is no fire-swept hell they are unwilling to dive into. If they fear anything, it is a warrior's life unlived and unknown. Pivotal to the culture of the Space Wolves is the saga. The oral traditions of Fenris's tribes are deeply entrenched. They are a warrior people, and each day may bring the rival's spear, the crushing wave, or the kraken's coils to end their life. The Fenrisians remind each other, and any spirits that may listen, of lost warriors' deeds. Generation after generation, they speak of the foes a hero slew, of the risks taken, and of the voyages made. The saga is a hero's history, and thus their very soul. In turn, such traditions have been embedded in the Space Wars. Though they are as gods to the Fenrisians, the canvas of their lives immeasurably bigger and the dangers they face incalculably greater, the importance of the saga remains. When a warrior of the Space Wars falls in battle, if his deeds are mighty enough, his battle brothers gather. Alone or in groups come the members of his pack and other packs, some even from other great companies. They each give an account of the fallen to a scald, one of their number skilled in the highly respected art form of remembering and retelling such histories. When the Space Wolves feast, which is often and loudly, they do so in the firelit and trophy-hung halls of the chapter, whether upon Fenris or aboard their warships. At an unspoken sign, the wolves of Fenris cease their deafening songs and their bouts of strength, and tankards refill with throat-burning yard. Then do the skulls recite the sagas, new and old. They tell of unalloyed heroism, of failure turned to victory, of great beasts and tricksters outwitted, and of traitors punished and monsters humbled. To roars of corpse-waking laughter, cheers for saga-worthy deeds, and the crackle of flame. To shouts and the slamming of fists on Fenris in Iron Oak, they tell of glory. It is not only warriors who forge sagas. The greatest weapons and armor of the chapter have storied histories of their own, woven as they slew fell beasts or defended the sons of Ras. The Thunderhammer, Vikskel, now thought lost, was crafted by the Iron Priest Bodra Silverskalp before he gifted it to the Wolf Lord Svergil Trollhowl. When Trollhowl was felled by an Elder Eye White construct, Vyskal was taken up by one of his wolfguard, with whom the weapon fought its way towards Svergil's slayer. When at last the warrior stood before his lord's murderer, he and Svergil claimed vengeance together. The repulsor, Yarvor, the Hammer of Asaheim, earned a heroic reputation amongst the Blackmanes for its relentless pursuit of the tainted creatures left on Fenris in the long aftermath of Magnus's siege. Of deeds and oaths. Space wolves go to war with the deeds of the chapter's past heroes in their minds, even as they fight alongside their living battle brothers. To make war in such mighty company stirs the blood and fires the soul. Death holds no fear for the space wolves. If a pack's wolf lord commands them to fall upon an enemy position and alone hold it with their lives against endless assaults, the task is accepted not with grim fatalism, but eagerness. 
If it is the pack's destiny to end the threat of their lives ensuring others' victory, if that is to be their end, then they will make such an end that tales of their glory and honor will echo throughout eternity. Space wolves take on cognomens of their own choosing or become known for some aspect of their appearance or character. It is often as a result of some death-defying deed they have survived or saga-worthy feat of arms. Thus did Ragnar take the name Blackmane when he slew one of those terrifying giants of wolf kind. So did pack leader's Hroth's skill with his plasma exterminators earn him the name Star Splitter, keeping it long after he left his headstrong days behind. Space will see power in names, reveling in what may have started as an insult or wager, and adding or changing them to reflect personal glory or to honor others. Space will set aside great store by traditions and have rigid notions of honor and justice. It is common for them to swear great oaths when vengeance must be taken, when honor or duty must be satisfied, or a drunken wager fulfilled. Some oaths are sworn to one's battle brothers, to one's wolf lord, or to the Primarch, wherever he may be. The most binding of these are weapon oaths, unbreakable vows sworn on the lethal tools of a born warrior. Many oaths are simply declaimed loudly that both friends and foe may hear. Still others are tattooed on the spaceman's leathery skin or inscribed in runic marks on their war gear. Though it may take many years to fulfill, or even the centuries-long life of a space marine, no space wolf would ever abandon an oath, for to do so would bring great shame. The Wolf Will Out Despite initial reservations, Primaris Space Marines swiftly integrated into the Space Wolves chapter. Yet even as the Wolf Lords argued over their acceptance, they already referred to the young and headstrong squads of Primaris Marines as blood claws. The blooded and experienced of their number as grey hunters, and the steady veterans as long fangs. These terms being so ingrained in the chapter's culture. As time passed, this informal argot developed further. Some warriors refer to all their great company's grey hunters as hunter packs, while blood claws and long fangs are synonymous for some with claw packs and fang packs. Whether they have been gifted the additional organs of cords devising or not, aggressive and undisciplined space wolves all know themselves to be blood claws, and none will gainsay them. Those Primaris marines who are loners and stealthy hunters, or whose heroism raises them above their pack, are singled out as such warriors always have been, and assigned to packs of wolf scouts or wolf guard, respectively. Wolf Priests When the tribes of Fenris fight their brutal wars, the battlefield is littered with corpses. A distant figure can often be seen standing high above, his penetrating gaze falling upon each warrior in turn. One who has proven himself as truly exceptional during the day's fighting may find that he is visited by a looming armoured figure, black as a warlock's soul, and with a leering wolf's skull instead of a face. The apparition emerges silently from the shadows, beckoning for the Fenrisian to come with him, to walk away from the love and warmth of his family forever. No tribesman has ever refused, for legend has it that the wolf priests not only have the ability to imbue true greatness, but also hold the keys to the stars themselves. Wolf priests are learned in the ways of biomechanics and chirurgery, and it is they who oversee the long and dangerous transformation from human aspirant to superhuman space marine. The first and last face a warrior of the space wolves will see in this time of service is the lupine-skulled mask of the wolf priest, for it is he who guides a warrior's apotheosis in those early years and he who administers the rites of Morkai when the warrior bleeds his last. Though they reap the gene seed of the fallen in much the same way as the apothecaries of other space marine chapters, preserving the gene heritage of his brethren is far from the wolf priest's only duty. They also function as cult leaders and spiritual guides in the manner of a space marine chaplain, each a living conduit that maintains the chapter's connection to the imperial creed. It is the wolf priests who keep the curse of the wolfen from overtaking the space wolves, and they take full responsibility for the development of their charges, martially, spiritually, and mentally. 
Wolf priests are beholden to none, save the great wolf and the Primarch himself. Even the proudest wolf lord bows before the ancient wisdom of a wolf priest, and will step aside from his path, for every lord was brought into the brotherhood of the space wolves by such a member, and will honour this debt until death. Each wolf priest goes to war with the totems of his office arrayed upon him. His grotesque wolf skull helm represents his role in the cycle of death and rebirth, and his crackling crozier sarcanum smites the unbeliever and the traitor wherever they may be found. As space marines, the sons of Russ are hardy in the extreme, their genetically enhanced bodies able to absorb a degree of punishment that would cripple the toughest of men many times over. Despite their legendary tenacity, however, even space wolves can be incapacitated by severe injuries, and it is to those wounded that a wolf priest applies a combination of rough surgery, shamanistic rites, and healing balms. While such strange chants and foul-smelling unguents are, are barbaric to more civilized chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, their effectiveness is incontrovertible. Some injuries cannot be treated, however, and perhaps the most defining tool of the wolf priest's trade is the Fang of Morkai, a complex and many-bladed device that allows the extraction of a dying space marine's progenoid glands so that his essence may live on to fight once again in a new host. As befits their station, wolf priests have access to a variety of equipment from the Fang's armories. With a jump pack, the wolf priest can lead a Skyclaw assault pack, or he can instead join a company's wolf guard and go to battle clad in jet black Terminator armor. Regardless of the armament he bears, the presence of a wolf priest fortifies nearby space wolves, for they know he will carry the worthy beyond the gates of Morkai, that they might fight the enemies of the Allfather forevermore. Of all the Primaris Battle Brothers, it was the Wolf Priests who encountered the greatest difficulties in gaining acceptance. At first, their battle chants were not of Fenris, but of Old Terror, copied from Legion manuals dating to the Great Crusade. However, their howling zeal and dedication has won over even the most grizzled Space Wolves, and with each battle the Primaris Wolf Priests become ever more steeped in Fenrisian custom. Iron Priests Masters of the Forge, the War Engine, and the Machine Spirit. The Iron Priests maintain the weapons and technology of the Space Wars. Without the Iron Priests, the Sons of Wrath would eventually be reduced to wearing plate mail instead of powered suits of armor. Without the Iron Priests, the Warriors of Fenris would be unable to take to the Star Sea in their great crenellated spacecraft. It is the Iron Priests who forge each blade and bless each bolter, and they who appease the spirits of Plasma of Flame, theirs as a brotherhood older than the chapter itself. Amongst the natives of Fenris, each tribe's smiths will worship the gods of iron, legendary figures said to reside within the volcanic islands adrift in the boiling sea. Three things are known of these gods. The molten metal runs through their veins, that fire dances at their command, and that they in turn worship at the altar of the brazen god of technology. A particularly gifted young Fenrisian smith may make a lonely pilgrimage to the smoke-shrouded Isles of Iron, determined to see these gods with his own eyes. Those with the wit and strength to complete the arduous journey do indeed meet with living gods, for this is the guise the Iron Priests maintain when dealing with mortal men. Each pilgrim is put to work in the lava forges, his skin and sweat sizzling as he labours to create the finest of swords within the mouth of the volcano. His dexterous hands are covered by bulky iron gloves, and his muscles scream with exertion as he transforms the crude metal around him into deadly tools of war. This is known as the test of the iron gauntlet. Should his work still be of masterful standard, and should he manage to pass the arduous trials laid before him, then he may be taken in as an apprentice and initiated into the space walls. Later, he will journey to Mars, the Red Planet, where he will learn the ways of the machine under the tutelage of the arcane and insular Adeptus Mechanicus. Only once he has fully embraced the mysteries of the Omnisire will he be allowed to return to Fenris and take his rightful place amongst the Iron Priests, bringing growling engines of war to life in the service of his chapter. Rune Priests 
most arcane of all the priesthoods of the Space Wolves. The Ruin Priests are distant and mysterious figures, often marked by the gods even before their induction into the Space Wolves. They are learned in shamanistic traditions that a mere tribesman could never truly comprehend. Theirs is knowledge of the mystic arts, of hidden rites handed down throughout the millennia that consume their days and haunt their nights. Rune priests keep their own counsel, living apart from their kin save to interpret the casting of the runes. During battle, however, the rune priests are roaring, raging incarnations of storm-born fury. Rune priests are masters of the storm, and the elements themselves obey their command. A rune priest may call upon Grandfather Blizzard to drive shards of ice into the flesh of his enemies, implore the Lord of Lightning to spear his nemesis from above, or compel the rocky jaws of Fenris herself to open, sending the enemy tumbling down into the planet's molten heart. None truly know how the spark of psychic ability that controls the elements becomes manifest within the soul. Maybe a brawling warrior will find electricity crackling from his fists, or a young blood claw will inexplicably survive a massive lightning strike and be forever touched with the power of the storm. Perhaps there is a latent psychic ability within the bloodlines of Fenris, yet there is unmistakably some irregularity in the Canis Helix that triggers such a change, for rune priests have also arisen from the ranks of the first Primaris Battle Brothers to join the Sons of Ras. To the men of the Fang, it matters not. All they care about is the Rune Priest's ability to serve the chapter with honor. How they achieve that is their own business. In truth, all believe in their hearts that every Fenrisian male is at least in part a son of the storm, and that there is nothing unnatural about the Tempest lending strength to its own. Rune Priests carry weapons covered from end to end in runes to glow red hot when power is channeled through them. It is with these graven sigils that the psychos of the Space Wolves control and direct the fury of the elements. Should a rune priest be required to teleport into a particularly hazardous war zone, such as the cramped corridors of a Space Hulk, often alongside a Wolf Lord and his Wolf Guard, he can even access the vaults of the Fang and don a suit of rune-encrusted Terminator armor. Regardless of his chosen armament, the rune priest may also don a psychic hood an arcane device that uses intricately arranged crystals that amplify its wearer's ability to nullify warp-based attacks. In addition to the weapons and armor of this station, rune priests carry talismans and totems, potent wards against the powers of the Immaterium. With these esoteric tools, it is the duty of the rune priest to banish the demon. Some rune priests also have cybernetically enhanced familiars that accompany them to war. Usually taking the form of a raven, these familiars are fitted with augmented relays that give their master a psychic view of large swathes of the battlefield. Pax of the Fang The Space Wolves chapter is divided into twelve great companies, and within each are a fluctuating number of squads, called Pax by the Sons of Ras. Rather than having sergeants, they are led by Pack leaders or Alphas, Commanding them in turn are the Wolf Lords, each a chief of their company and answerable only to the master of the chapter, the Great Wolf. The packs progress through a series of stages, identified by the color of the markings they bear upon their armor. Many packs fight together for life and remain in their oath-sworn great company. The competitiveness of their warriors tempered over the years into iron-hard bonds of brotherhood. Newly inducted Space Wolves retain the exuberance and ferocity of the young fighters they were. Risk-takers and often ill-disciplined, they bear pack markings in yellow and red. Their Wolf Lord usually directs them to fight in aggressive packs as bikers, jump pack troopers, and close-quarters combatants. When their pack has been blooded with numerous battles, the experienced and mature Space Wolves rededicate their markings in red and black. Such packs form the majority of most great companies' strength. Their Wolf Lord often deploys these dependable fighters in adaptable units, fluid in both attack and defense, as roving predators taking and holding key assets. When a pack has emerged victorious from countless campaigns, they will solemnly alter their pack markings to the white and black of Azheim's enduring peaks. 
veterans of centuries with the utmost trust of their lord. These disciplined, wise and dangerous warriors are often granted the most powerful and precise weapons. During any such stage, a space wolf may be taken from his original pack, his skills put to better use in the specialized packs of the great company. In markings of grey and black, silent and cunning, pre-stalkers prowl the wilds, hunting the foe far from boisterous company, while those of the wolf lord's closest companions bear yellow and black. These are his hand-picked wolf guard, the best of the great company, mentors and inspirational heroes all wish to emulate. The Great Companies Like the tumultuous Fenrisian Isles, the great companies of the Space Wars are not permanently fixed. Where one wolf lord falls, another must rise to lead his battle brothers, taking a figure from Fenrisian myth to be his sigil. Though varied, every wolf lord and great company strives to embody the virtues of strength, courage and honour that define their Primarch. Each great company is near autonomous. They have not conformed to the structures laid out in the Codex Astartes, and charges have often been levied, from a safe distance, that the Space Wars maintain far more warriors than its dictates allow. Each is commanded by a Wolf Lord, equivalent to the captains of the chapters. He rules a brotherhood of eager warriors fueled by battle lust, and his resources give him the capacity to hunt down and kill any prey. In the Wolf Lord's lair within the Fang are stores of powerful war gear and mastercrafted weapons. He commands a fleet of warships to sail the Sea of Stars, as well as powerful war engines such as battle tanks, anti-grav vehicles and bulky war suits, some of which are centuries or even millennia old. The machine spirits as aggressive and savage as ever. Upon the enormous stone tablets of the Grand Annalus, Within the hall of the Great Wolf on Fenris, each company is represented by the sigil of their Wolf Lord. The Space Wolves have many dozens of sigils throughout their history, some descended from ancient Fenrisian myths, but many developed solely in the Space Wolves' own mystic traditions. Some, like the Space Wolf, have not been selected in millennia. The symbolism of each is not only fixed in myth, but absorbs the deeds and characters of each great company, consuming their sagas. Thus do some sigils recur in cycles of prominence, while others, with connections to fallen heroes or bad omens, remain thought of as cursed. Such is the case with the Hunger Skull, tied forever to the traitor Jorgen Vor. Great Companies The Blood Moors Bran Redmoor's personal icon is the bloodied hunter, and his company's savagery is legend. Some say the curse of the Wolfen runs deep within their ranks, Bran has been seen to attack with a howling pack of wolfen, and sometimes even succumbs to the Canis Helix himself in battle. Yet his warriors are cunning. The Wolf Lord's numerous grey hunters often lie in wait to the foe's rear, after the fury of Bran's frontal attack forces their enemies' retreat. The Sea Wolves Engir Krakendum's sigil is that of the Sea Wolf, often chosen from the Kraken hunting islanders of the south. Many of his men are darker skin and temperament. They go to war embarked upon armoured transports and airborne assault craft adorned with shields. Their swift claws and outriders harry the foe upon the flanks, ensuring the packs reach the enemy in an unstoppable tide. The Sons of Morkai Named after the wolf god long before taking on the sigil of the two-headed beast, Eric Morkai has always been grim and stern of aspect. His company has a great many wolf scout packs, fellow hard-eyed warriors who appreciate their master's taciturn demeanor. Eric's terrifyingly effective methods involve solving problems with swift and bloody acts of violence. It is rumored that the growing cult of the Hounds of Morkai look to Eric as a silent alpha. The Red Moons The Wolf of the Red Moon is a skeletal beast that prowls the Seven Hells in Fenrisian myth, devouring the unworthy and yet never growing fat. The Wolf Lord who bears this symbol, Gunnar Redmoon, is a roaring bear of a man and as boastful as a bard. He favours fang packs such as aggressors and centurion devastators. Like him, they are possessed of a strong appetite for heavy firepower and even heavier feasting. Champions of Fenris The great company of Logan Grimnar is fanatically loyal to its charismatic and cunning leader. 
Each warrior is extremely proud of his link to the Supreme Lord of the chapter, and constantly vies with his peers for the Great Wolf's favour. Logan Grimnar firmly believes that a battle can be carried by a few heroes in the right place at the right time, and as such makes effective use of the many wolf guard in his great company. The Death Wolves Harald Deathwolf takes the symbol of the ravening jaw, icon of the wolf time, when Morkai will eat the sun and eternal night will shroud the stars. Harald himself rides to war upon Icetooth, a great grey thunderwolf. He is the chapter's foremost hunter, for his senses are so sharp he can smell fear. Harald's great company includes a host of lupine beasts, be they flesh and blood or cybernetic constructs. The Stormwolves Bjorn Stormwolf is a ruddy mountain of muscle and bellowed impatience. He has taken Drekken the Thunderwolf as his symbol, for he too is a creature of ferocity over stealth. When the Stormwolves go to war, they utilize many heavy weapons, bikes, vindicators and jump packs, for they rejoice in the din of battle more than any other company. The Iron Wolves Vorek Nalfest has cemented his relatively recent position amongst the Wolf Lords, having learned his craft under Lord Egil, whose Iron Wolf sigil he kept as, as a mark of respect. His great company's armoured assaults are greatly feared. Squadrons of repulsor executioners hunt monstrous enemies, while Vorex packs of Wolf Scouts outflank the foe in impulsor transports, before closing in on them like inescapable iron jaws. The Drake Slayers Crumb Dragon Gaze has a presence of will so strong that his fiercely loyal wolf guards say only the mythical Sun Wolf has a hope of staring him down. Crumb loves taking part in all kinds of contests, from the trial of the Bladed Eye to the rivalries he fosters within the great companies and without. The Black Manes Perhaps the most talented wolf lord of all, Ragnar Black Manes' sheer ferocity is the stuff of legend. Though he is comparatively young, he is without doubt a warrior born. Ragnar frequently has the honor of planning and leading the Space Wolves' planetary invasions, seeding a world with ravening packs of reavers before launching one of his famed lightning fast drop assaults. The Fire Howlers Sven Bloodhowl, Lord of the Fire Howlers, has been missing since he assaulted the Will of Eternity, one of Abaddon's Blackstone fortresses. While some believe his saga to be ended, his wolf guard rule in his name until his fate is determined. The fire howlers tattoo themselves with Bloodhow's volcanic icon, the Fire Breather, alongside runes depicting their own sagas. The Grim Bloods. In Fenrisian myth, the fire wolf burns without being consumed. Some whisper Kjar Grimblood bears a gift, that he can see visions in the fires of war. The Wolf Lord and his pack have not been seen on Fenris in a long time as they burn a trail of destruction through endless warbands of equally savage orcs. The Thirteenth Company The blank name stone set into the Grand Annalas was once that of Jorin Bloodhowl's great company, known as the Wolfenkind. They who hounded the Thousand Sons into the warp during the Horus Heresy. Though some Wolfen appear to have returned, the stone continues to represent all of the great companies across history, that have fallen or were lost in battle. Curse of the Wolfen The ferocity and savagery of the Space Wolves is well attested by other Imperial forces who have had the terrifying honor of fighting alongside them. Some Imperial commanders attribute what they see as, as the Space Wolves' feral barbarism to their origins amongst Fenris's warring tribes. In reality, the chapter's bestial nature goes far deeper, into the core of their being. All signs of Lehman Ras bear genetic traits they inherited from their progenitor Primarch. Like that of all Adeptus Astartes, the gene seed of the Space Wolves works changes on the body and the mind, interacting with the specialized organs implanted into every warrior. Some of these alterations and synergies may once have been understood by the great mystic geneticists of Mars, Terra and Luna, yet most were only ever fully grasped by the Emperor himself. Space Wars have heightened instincts, preternatural senses and a raw aggression that make them consummate hunters and devastating shock troops. Yet these traits are merely the outer pelt of a ferocious nature that is usually suppressed, 
of an inner beast, a base in incoherent rage, terrible hunger, and bloodthirsty fury. The Space Wolves know that intangible shadow as the Wolfen, and it resides in each of them without exception. The Test of Morkai Aspirants of the Space Wars chapter undergo many arduous and deadly trials before they are bloodily transformed with strange tools and arcane science into space marines. They are tested by the priesthoods for their suitability in mind, body and spirit. Many aspirants fail in these tests. Of these failures, the lucky pass swiftly into the realm of Morkai, the two-headed wolf god of Fenrisian myth who guards the gates of death. Some few continue to serve as serfs, forever shamed by defeat, or as unthinking half-human servitors. Many of these tests differ depending on the aspirant and even the traditions of individual great companies, yet the final one is always the same, the test of Morkai. The warrior is taken far into the barren wastes beyond the fortress of the Fang. He drinks from the cup of the Wolfen, and his body absorbs the first and most deadly component of the Space Wolf's gene seed, the Canis Helix. No distinction is made between those who go on to be implanted with the organs of Primera Space Marines and those matured more traditionally. No aspirants are exempted from the test of Morkai. The Canis Helix is necessary. Without this essential part of Lehman Russ's heritage, the other gene helices cannot be implanted. The frightening potency of the Canis Helix has accounted for the lives of many aspirants. The numbers will never be known, since the sons of Russ rarely record failure. All those not killed by the draft from the Cup of Wolfen undergo a monstrous transformation. The Helix works hideous changes on the warrior's mind and body. Bones split and buckle before fusing. Thick hair sprouts across his body, and he is overcome with a desire to hunt, kill, and gut himself on fresh meat. His body mass swells and his teeth grow into sharp fangs. Whilst in the throes of excruciatingly painful change, the aspirant is cast into the wilderness, alone, and left to make his way back to the fang. The warrior must overcome the hunger within him, as it possesses him entirely. If he does not, he will become one of the feral creatures known, like the shadow in his soul, as the Wolfen. If the aspirant finds his way back to the Fang, despite the ravaging changes and the many perils that lie before him, he is implanted with the remainder of the Space Wolf's gene seed, stabilizing the Canis Helix and completing his apotheosis. With time, however, it becomes clear that some of these warriors have not completely conquered the Canis Helix's original effects. In moments of great fury, at the zenith of their battle frenzy, some alter into that bestial state. This is the curse of the Wolfen, an ever-present threat that haunts the soul of every son of Ras. Savage Echoes To become one of the Wolfen during the test of Morkai is to roam the wilderness forevermore as a creature of the darkest night. Or be captured by their former brothers and held as a caged beast until time is right for them to be set loose in battle. Those who succumb to the inner beast during battle may be able to reassert control once all before them lay dead, once the pounding rush of blood becomes less deafening and the scent of their prey's fear has died with them. Some cannot. They become locked in a cycle of berserk fury, forever fallen from grace as feared reminders of what may await any son of Ras. In battle, their savage howls speak to the muzzled fury within each of the Wolf King's line, inflaming the passions of even the most self-possessed. Amongst the Space Wolves, there are other Wolfen, their origins uncertain even to those gifted with wisdom. Singly or in packs, they have been discovered across the galaxy, bearing remnants of ancient war gear. Many are marked with the heraldry of the lost 13th Great Company, though there are other sigils and runes that cannot be read among their panoply. Wary talk abounds of the wolf kind and ancient prophecies, of tragic brothers and curses. Whether these are truly those same warriors who vanished so long ago, horribly changed, may never be known. Still recognizing their fellow warriors as battle brothers, the Space Wolves usher packs of Wolfen aboard gunships and deploy them into the heart of the enemy. At other times, the Wolfen lope across the field, their instinct leading them to the thickest fighting. 
They bear fragments of armour shaped to fit their altered anatomies, pack marked with the white of fangs and the red of blood. With iron hard talons, marrow freezing claws, or weapons so huge that only they can wield them, wolf and tear apart any before them. The beast entombed. Beneath the fang, in the frozen non existence of stasis fields, the pilots of the chapter's dreadnoughts slumber between wars. Though little remains of their once heroic physiques, still these epic warriors bear the genetic legacy of Rus. In rare cases, the sleeping beast within their psyche awakes and the curse of the Wolfen ravages and distorts the warrior's mind. Wolfen dreadnoughts unleash rampant devastation, their metallic snarls and howls blared through emitters as they charge towards any enemy, sweeping long claws or massive axes through anything that dares stand in their way. There is one amongst these Bemis, whose violent storms of slaughter eclipse all others. Discovered by the Space Wars on the hell world of Omnicide, the feral dreadnought, known only as Murderfang, is a single-minded berserker of metallic rage. Whatever noble son of Fenris once piloted this untamed force of destruction is long since lost, consumed entirely by the bestial thing at Murderfang's heart. Only by using Hellfrost technology to freeze its servos between battles can its wrath be stayed. Only an hour passed before the two forces exited the cave. The tension had been cut when the wolves had gone back to their sagas and laughing, seeming to have no concern whatsoever about the potential for a reckoning. Even with the coming prospect of facing the guns of an entrenched force of marines with nothing to lose, the wolves seemed utterly unperturbed, excited for the battle, despite the previous hiccup. But now all were outside. The wolf priest and lieutenant gave each other a final nod, and off they went. The Primaris marines of the Legates of Terra were to assail the front gates. They had enough for the task, they stated. The Eliminators and the Intercessors were in enough numbers to give the Hellblasters their chance. It had been tabled that some of them should go with the wolves, but this had been flatly refused by the wolf priest. Both officers knew that the key to an assault on the fortress itself would require as many guns and bodies as possible to reduce casualties. The more guns they had with them, the more they could put pressure on the walls and crenellations, forcing the defenders to keep their heads down, and thus reducing the fire that would come at the Hellblasters. The Eliminators would be able to fire into murder holes as well. So accurate were these warriors. As soon as the Hellblasters had used their plasma rifles to carve an ingress point, and enough intercessors with bolt pistols and chainsaws ready to enter, again, the more the merrier, the more the safer. They would be able to fan out more effectively, not being outnumbered or hemmed in. So it would mean a much higher butcher's bill, if even one squad of legates were diverted. But both knew another truth. The legates of Terra were to be allowed distraction. It had come down from on high, but they were just a delivery system. Brass expected the wolf guard to take the majority of the scalps. The lieutenant knew it, but never divulged this to his men. Why create the tension, the rivalry, is what he had thought at the time. A pity tempers had already flared, but it would make no difference to the events of the day, he hoped. The legates were to gain the slopes and hit the gates in two hours as the sun began to rise. But Floki would go with them to represent. The wolves were to scale the sheer walls of ice and snow and toward the walls at its upper summit. The lieutenant had raised an eyebrow at this as he could not see how they would scale that surface at that angle in time. But the priest had been stern. Yet as the legates began their careful hike up, gentler but more open slopes, the wolves watched them for a minute or two. They seemed to be jostling one another, literally wasting time until the Primaris had left. But as the legates got further away, they moved again. Some just ran at the mountain's wall, diving at the last second and slamming into it, only to use their weapons, gauntleted fingers and feet to catch purchase so swiftly, to swing from some outcrop to another. 
They bounded up the wall at a pace that the Leggetts would have found bemusing. At any time, any of them could make even the slightest misjudgment of a rock or ledge and plummet to their death. But there was not a single shred of fear in them. The wind blew so hard, so loudly, that there was no way of anything being heard from above. It was a good half hour before the set time. The five wolves hung together, all below the last ledge, spread out, but all able to see each other. As one after another checked their time stamp, a low rumbling began to rise. They would not wait. The legates, despite their surly sergeant, had been good allies, had assisted them in waging a war against a foe not only vile enough, but adept enough to make it worthy of song. But they were so young, all of them, <laughs> none above three hundred. And thus did the pack feel that the legates had already gained a deep draught from the heady brew of glory. Also, they had scoffed. Only one, aye, but his squad backed him up in their silence. And that could not stand. Win, lose, or draw, the deed needed to be done. So why not sooner rather than later? All looked at the wolf priest as he hung. He looked across at the pack leader, Dolph, who just shrugged as best he could while himself hanging from a ledge. All started nodding at the priest. Then Dolph did too. Tension rising, anticipation so palpable they could all taste it. Until finally the wolf priest gave his curt permission, nodding the once at Dolph. And at that one nod, they moved. Kram and Sven leapt up and over the ledge at the flanks. The rest followed suit, the priest coming in last. They all scrambled up the walls of the fortress, their weapons making handholds, their feet kicking into the very rockcrete. The wind was still up. As the flurry of snow still whipped around them, they scaled. At the very top, they halted for a moment only as Krom lifted himself up for a quick shifty around. He bobbed down again, and using their sign language informed all of the marines in the fence. Phew. Here, anyway. Dolph just lifted himself up and rolled over the wall and onto the walkway, standing swiftly to challenge the one marine on his end. As Kargir and Sven leapt over the top of the other side of the walkway, as the target wasted not a nanosecond in raising his bolt rifle to fire, Krom snuck over behind him and just picked him up and threw him over the long drop. The one facing the pack leader was no less swift, but Dolph seemed swifter. It was touted that Primaris were larger, stronger and faster than their Astartes brethren, but Dolph moved with the surety and speed of a warrior born. His claws cutting off the barrel and then erupting through the marine's chest as he pushed him back into the small fortified area he had come from. The wolves looked across and saw that they were a collection of eternal champions on the other side. It seemed that they expected the attack to be from the front and had more men patrolling and watching there, but not many. More must have been inside. Not yet alerted then. Good. Floki had shown the legates the best pass to approach without being spotted. There was little talk between the marines now. They knew what they had to do had been at their business and battling side by side for many a year. It only needed one initial order to guide the entire battle now. A choice of stance and style. From Dolph, of course. Okay, gentle. Go play loudly. Bring them back here. Axe chase. And so they fanned out. An old pattern. A well-loved way of war. The five moved down the stairwells quietly, and then came into the base proper. At that, Kargir and Krom went their separate ways, one heading to the east, one to the west. Dolph and the wolf priest were to follow Sven the Gentle, most violent of men, as he went to perform his tried and tested method of attack. Thus did Sven charge directly into the first main hall and espy a squad of eternal champions there. He stepped out and simply threw his mighty two-handed axe into the first one he saw spinning end over end before smashing into the chest of the largest primaris in the group. The marine was thrown backwards so hard he slammed into the wall and was half kept up as the blade of Sven rang as it dug into the wall through its victim's body. 
Come on, little piggies. Come to Sven the Gentle. The remaining four marines then charged after retreating Sven, as he turned on his heel and ran for it, shouting over his shoulder. Come on, piggies. You're not even trying. Sven charged down the corridors and was followed by the champions. They were indeed gaining on him, always a few paces behind, not able to get a good sighting on him to shoot. But after only a moment, it seemed as if they had run in a square, as Sven slammed through a doorway and rolled forward to grab his axe out of the wall. He turned and stated to his pursuers, Only two piggies left. Ah, my friends cannot take you now. You are Sven's. Come, piggies. Can you avenge one of your men at least? Come to Sven. The two following eternal champions looked at each other, then down the corridor they had just left. Out stepped the priest and the pack leader. Both had grabbed one of their compatriots as they passed. You're mine. And slain them before the others had noticed. Both raised their bolt pistols to fire, and both hit. Sven took one in the shoulder, one in the torso, but neither direct hits. One pierced, blowing chunks out of the center side of Sven, but still he came on. He arced his huge axe down and sliced the legs from one of them. Sven continued his circle and tore the other marine across the shoulder, tearing the top third of the torso and head from the bulk. Then Resyolda! He then turned around and raised his axe thrice more slicing both the arms and then the head from the one who had lost his legs and fell forward onto his face. The marine was now in six pieces. They barely tried. Disappointing. There's no one here worthy of the kiss of Sven's axe. Bah, the search goes on. Don't worry, brother. There are more. Let's go see what they've got, eh? Stalking down the corridors, Krom could hear the commotion that Sven was making, and had already picked off two marines as they ran from their cells. But now a much more cautious marine came out. Krom cleared his throat and the marine ominously slowly looked over in his direction. What a treat! One of the big wigs. Always wanted to see what a chaplain could do in clothes. You think I will lose concentration? We'll rise to your goading. Nah, this is honestly you are hearing. I can see why you find it confusing, being of who you are, of the pack you are. Rats. Well, little wolf, you will find that this rat has teeth. And with that, the chaplain raised his crozier and swept it towards Crom in a dozen almost flawless strokes. Crom ducked back and then low, drawing the champion into a larger room, each evasion only inches or less away from his death. It was close. Good, not bad at all. This might be worth adding to my tail. Don't let me down now. This is the last and the most important fight of your life. Give me your all, rat. Crom now began to block with his own frost axe, then leapt backwards and bounced up and down on his heels for a second. He then leapt forward with an almighty overhead hack, but as the chap inside stepped and planted a backhand on the brash marine, cracking his cheekbone. The wolf just continued the spin and spat blood onto his enemy's visor. Excellent! The chaplain rushed him in return, a flurry of attacks coming from not only the crackling heavy mace in his hand. Wreathed with energy, any hit could be the end of the young wolf. The crozes would make a mockery of his armor if it were but to hit once. Well recovered! The chaplain then tried to sweep the young marine, who leapt over the attack. The chaplain already had his plasma pistol raised and fired at the wolf as he landed, but he rolled below the blast of plasmatic death. Ah! Missed opportunity there. The wolf then struck at every single quarter of his enemy, forcing him back in turn. The chaplain could not believe it. He was being outfought by an Astartes. Your guard is too high. Try lowering it a little. The size disparity, eh? As the wolf came in with another flurry of rapid attacks, mixed in with kicks and punches, the chaplain blocked them all. Now you're getting it! The chaplain countered, and then attempted to behead the young wolf. Come on! You can do better, rat! Is this all you have? The chaplain then attempted to use his greatest strength to bash the axe out of the hands of the wolf by sheer power alone. The wolf seemed to back away under each strike, 
the chaplain increasing the power and arc of each of his strikes to finish Scrum. But as he raised himself up for what he felt would be the last strike, the young wolf just rolled past him and turned so swiftly the chaplain could not respond in time. The frost axe went into both of the chaplain's knees and then shoulders in quick succession. A well-practiced move, it seemed, but one the chaplain had never seen before. He now toppled forward onto his own hacked and buckled knees, his arms no longer obeying his commands, dangling at his sides. The young wolf took four steps to pile around to before him, looking down. You fought well. You, at least, shall be buried with honour. The rest? They go to Floki. But not you. I call you a rat no more. At least you die. A chaplain. The chaplain nodded understanding and drew himself up for his end. No matter how he may have lived, he knew how to die. The last axe blow was swift and final. A true mercy. Taking the other side of the base, Cargear ran around the corridors like the others. He charged a corridor cross-section and beheaded two who stood there, dumbfounded, as they could not react before his well-practiced attack took them both. Listening. Distracted as they were. At that, another Eternal Champion turned the corner, probably rushing to the clamor kicked off by Sven and Dov that had so distracted the two previous victims. Upon seeing the old wolf, the aggressor stopped in his tracks. A huge marine, even for a Primaris, and only made worse by his gravis armor. You're outdated and outmatched. Going to run, little dog. The war fleet is only ever as good as the man who wears it. At that, Kargir then extended one hand and beckoned with his fingers twice. You'll pay for that, midget. And the aggressor then raised his Boltstorm gauntlets and let off a huge gout of shots while charging forward. Kargir immediately dived into one of the rooms off the corridor, then bounded from one to the other, making his way forward as well. Each blistering volley from the aggressor barely missing him as both men made for each other. At the last, Kagi rolled into a darkened room, but did not come out. The eternal champion came to the door and stood there silhouetted, his gauntlets whirling menacingly. A dark room. Kagi drew his blade, and the blue lambent glow from it showed his gnarled and ancient long toothed face as he said, you are not worthy of this! No, not worthy at all! The Eternal Champion then charged at him, preparing to use his two power fists to make mulch of the old wolf. But Kagia sheaths the sword and swings up his combi weapon. A string of shots from the underslung area slams into the aggressor, and it slows with each pace. The reason? As the melter elements of Kargir's weapon hits him, the armor shines more like a star with each shot that hits. Until finally, the aggressor too stopped, his armor melting and flowing into the man inside. The hole then keeling forward to the ground and lay there smoking. The Allfather's justice cannot be stopped by any armor devised by man, god, or even Belisarius' call. Burn, traitor! Kagir then rounded the body in search of more foes to slay. Sen was now with Kagir and Krom as they sailed the outer defences from the inside. The eliminators of the legates of Terra, picking off two marines from the battlements as they began their assault, swathes of fire hitting the ramparts. The gates were old and melted and blew back under the concentrated fire of the Hellblasters. The intercessors barreled in, led by Floki, and were then in amongst their enemy, fighting side by side with the pack as they finished off the squads at the gates. All the while, the two officers walked to the centre of the base. Down in the stairways they went, until finally they broke into two upon reaching the bottom. It could have been either of them that finally came to the door, but it turned out to be Dolph. One marine was there, 
the last eternal champion captain. If the other strike teams across the planet had been successful, possibly the last eternal champion. Standing proud and tall in his huge armor, the two men eyed each other. The captain drew out his power sword, and Dolph just charged his power claws. So, the wolves finally make it into my den. Mighty are the sons of Lehman Russ, but, but to send mere midget marines against me? This is more than laughable. No, no grandiose boasts about how you'll take my head? Use my skull as a drinking receptacle in one of your barbaric feasts? The time for talk is over. It was over the second you cowards decided to turn on your own. Prepare to die, you heap of dung. <sighs> Pathetic. I'd expected some banter before the main event. I'll just destroy you in front of your men. Floki dines well tonight. The two ran towards each other and Power Sword rang on Power Claw. The larger captain, a Prime Meris, was faster and heavier, but had not experience, it seemed. For Dolph had been a wolf for a long year, had fought many, had slain many, had witnessed much, and the experience told. Out of the doors of the room, down the corridors, up flights of stairs, down others. Punches, headbutts, elbows, swings missed and hit. They fought like gods. The captain and he dueled for so long that eventually there was an audience. The lieutenant and the priest, and most of his pack, all now looked on or shouted encouragement as the two fought up and down the base. The eternal champion finally tired. His last swing so dazzlingly fast it nearly caught Dolph's head. Near killed him. But he was just in time to block. Just. But as the captain held his pose after the swing, he looked down. His armor was in tatters, and his intestines were spilling out. So wide was the rent made by the other hand of Dolph. For while he was blocking, his left claw had killed the captain. As the Prime Heiress fell backwards and simply passed away, the courtyard exploded into cheering, and it was over. The battle done, the enemy vanquished, the very last of the Eternal Champions brought down. The Wolf Priest was transporting the most precious thing in the base, the future. What are you doing? Saving the precious gene seed, brother. What does it look like? But that's not the Ironheart Seed. That's Eternal Champions. It's corrupted, worthless. Why bother? Because the fault was never in the seed. It was only in the ego of those who bore it. Let us salvage something from this calamity. It will all be sent back. The Allfather knows. We need every warrior we can get. Why? He has us. And we cannot be everywhere. That's why we have brother marines. We must always have brother marines. Then what do we do? We watch them, brother. We watch them. The battle barges and their fleet stalked each other, matching orbit and speed. No one on either fleet was now unaware of the matter in hand. The legates of Terra, one of their squads had impugned the honor of the company, and the challenge had to be met. Storm Ravens took off from the Legates of Terror battle barge, multiple companies strong, all armed to the teeth. Like a boarding action against a hated foe, the Ravens seemed more like a swarm than an organized flight as they dropped into the hangar, disgorged their men, and they went straight back outside again. But none went back to the Legates' fleet, 
they simply kept pace below and above the main gun batteries of the Space Wolves battle barge, in its blind spot, seemingly ready to strike at the first sign of trouble. For their part, as the embarkation hangar filled with marines in their ranks and files, only a score of Space Wolves stood by the main doors, all resplendent in their finest furs over their armour, in absolute contrast to the army now marching on their very decks. All were armed with large and deadly weapons. None were just for show, each a masterpiece of artisanry. Yet all who stood seemed calm, relaxed, almost welcoming in their nods of appreciation of the orderly march of the legates. Pointing out a dreadnought here, an especially heaving banner there, for the legates had arrived with every last panoply of every squad and company that they had brought. And they looked gorgeous. Formidable, yet so well kept and regimented. When the last men had disembarked, the chapter master walked to the center of his miniature army and had his personal banner raised. Surrounded by first company veterans, he looked no less impressive than his men. The space wolves nodded at this gesture, and four on either side peeled off and went to dramatically push open the doors, so large were they. As they opened, the visitors were struck with a view that few had ever witnessed, certainly none who the wolves would call enemy. For there it was, a huge corridor with its upper height so distant they could barely be made out, and hiding each wall were not just the men two paces apart, each stood facing the centre, an honour guard marking the way to an even larger room. But behind these men, these superb warriors, all stood to perfect attention, there were statues, frescoes, banners, trophies. They went from the floor to the rafters. So many battle honours. Hundreds of pennants and flags. Hundreds of them. So much glory. So much. For the legates now saw in this one vision everything that they had not truly understood before. The sheer honour achieved by this chapter and this was only one of its companies, not its central keep. Though the legates of Terra had everything to be proud of, a near spotless account, compared to just what was on display here, their achievements were as a child's candle to a supernova. They were in awe. Aye, even space marines as they were, every last one of them was in awe. When their head approached the last doors, they were again thrown ceremoniously open by multiple wolves on either side, and a wave of light and heat bathed the legates of terror as they marched inside. The fires that burned in each of ten huge nestles in the walls only reflected the greater light of the fires that burned in a huge pit at the center of what could only be called a massive hall. The collection of highest honor banners, awards and accommodations that filled the wall that looked down on the entire proceedings were dazzling again still. The company commanders of the Space Wolves stood before the fire, their men around the huge benches and tables on either side. The chapter master's foot slammed down and as one his men stopped, all in perfect rank and file, looking at their hosts. The great wolf of the company, the lord of the ship and army, opened his arms expansively and walked to the chapter master of the legates of terror. For his part, the chapter master strode forward too. Now only four or more paces away from each other, the two stopped. The chapter master broke the silence. I am told there is a matter of honor to be resolved. The wolf lord then nodded, his scowl so tight, his eyes so narrow as to make him look about to strike. The tension rose amongst the legates. The scowl seemed to say it all. The wolf lord then turned and nodded to a group of men in his army. From the end of the hall, dramatically placed it seemed, the pact walked slowly and heavily, shoulders back, chests out, each moving with purpose. They stopped and their leader intoned. Honour has been impugned. We must gain satisfaction now. The Wolf Lord then turned back to the chapter master of the Legates and raised an eyebrow. Another wolf priest stepped forward and looked at the chapter master. One of our packs have been challenged. 
Do the legates of Terra answer this challenge? Do they follow through? Are they in attendance and prepared to take the consequences of their actions? The chapter master of the legates of Terra nodded slowly. A unit of marines then took one step sideways and filed past their comrades into the front. The legates outnumbered the wolves two to one, in the squad and in the hall. Yet they were not the ones who looked assured. The wolf lord looked to the chapter master and nodded again. At this, the lieutenants of both forces now peeled off and led their men to prearranged marks. The legates all approached the benches and tables and, as per their invitation, took one step apart from each other. Then it was that the space wolves marched loudly and exactly to the right behind them, then stepped once to the side and once forward. And as the halls were now presented with one wolf, then one legate, the legates took off their helms and placed them on their belts. The wolves and legates officers then all barked out a command and the entire congregation sat as one. The two squads stood glaring at each other, the wolves confidently. The legates were stoic, but it was plain to see that they did not want this battle. The poor fools. They did not know what was to happen next. It is our custom that the challenge chooses the weapons to settle the matter. Do you have any objection to this custom? Good. It was then that the company serfs brought forward metal cases smaller than a bolter, but clearly the weapons to be used in this duel. Each of the marines was presented with a case, but knew not to open it until the order was given. Bemused but resigned, the legates stood. At that, huge barrels were dragged and placed in a perfect line between the two squads, like nothing the legates had ever seen before. And then... And then the other wolf priest barked, Prepare your weapons for combat! The wolves all placed their cases on a barrel and were matched by the legates. As the clips were unlatched and the tops were lifted, the marines all looked on in wide-eyed confusion until one of them blurted out, It's a cup! He was right, as each of the legates drew out a mug of finest gold. They looked up and saw that each of their combatants had a wooden horn at least thrice the size of their tankards. The Wolf Lord then looked at the Chapter Master and grinned. He led him to the head table, half being left open for legate officers, half for wolves. When they had all reached their places, the other wolf priest bellowed, Only one side walks out of this hall! For the honour of your squad, your pack, your chapter! Let battle commence! And at that, in one fluid motion, each of the space wolves slammed their hands covering their horns, through the wood of the barrels before them, each lifting out a full horn of liquid and glared at their opposite numbers. Rumour has it you legates punch like chapter serfs. Time to prove you don't drink like them too. The marines of the legates now looked at their combatants and each followed suit, filling their much smaller mugs to the brim. And then it began. What the legates of Terra would later call the Battle of the Mead Hall as both squads then quaffed their first drinks. Ha! Come on, Legates! Come on! You drink like babies! My helm can hold more ale than thee! The tables before the companies of marines were filled to groaning with meat and drink. And as the first liquor was finished, the hall burst into shouts from the wolves as they began to chant and laugh and raise their own drinks, egging their men on. At first the legates look appalled, until their own chapter master stood and drank with the company commander. As the battle ensued, the wolf priest Olaf stepped to the centre of the room before the main tables of honour before the fire, and turning to make sure all could hear, he opened a huge tome and, still looking all around the hall, including all but the combatants, he began. And now, brothers... Sons of the Rus, Legates of Terra, I have the honour to share with you the tales of our fallen friends, for in their reciting, they are never gone. If we remember them, their glory lives on. But know this, by our joint efforts, the seed of the Iron Hearts has been saved. They shall rise again. So, 
let us keep the fire burning until they can stand amongst us once more. I read from the Iron Heart's Annals of Glory, the first, the Battle of Fronten V, the humbling of Warg Blitzgalger. Nobody truly recalled the details of the Battle of the Mead Hall. In fact, few remembered who was the first to fall, the first to slope to the side and topple, the first to give offerings to Cardinal Chanda. All just remembered that, like all battles in which they were involved, the last married standing were of the Volker Fenrika, the Space Wolves.